all good all right here <laughs> on rebellious ufology i am the newly named lynn hurley with my dashing co-host mr jim goodall how are you jim i'm doing great uh just spent four quick days in minnesota with my uh see my my son and my daughter uh my four of my five grandsons and what makes people just say how in the hell you do that my wife and i stay with my ex-wife I think that's amazing. And uh, and when she comes to Minnesota, I mean, comes from Minnesota to Arizona, you know, she stayed here uh, a couple times. So, nice. and Rosemary's ex-husband stays with us with his girlfriend sometimes when he comes down from Seattle. So, it's uh, I have an unusual relationship with exes. Yes. Yeah. There's there's a few of them out there would like to have me whack, but that's okay. <laughs> uh, and and he won't be on for the whole show, but one of probably the best researchers when it comes to historical UFO sightings and events is Michael Schrett. And he doesn't, he doesn't give his opinion. What he does is he, he takes the information he has with all the supporting documents and he, and he builds a storyline around it with, uh, with illustrations. And in, you know, in a lot, some cases it's full color. I mean, it, you, you would think, you would think he had a, an art department, he's art department working for him, but he doesn't, but he's, no one does it better than Michael. Absolutely nobody. And when he, when he gives a presentation, it is probably the best one you're going to hear. But again, he's, he doesn't express his opinion. He, it's like, he's like Joe Friday from drag, you know, dragnet, the yeah. facts, just the facts. <laughs> and uh, right now he's, he's down in uh, San Clemente with an artist that, uh, He's contracted to do some more artwork for some of his presentations. And he has uh, his YouTube channel. Uh, it's, it's, it's doing very, very well. It's uh, Blue Room Media. Uh, and anybody out there would like to hear uh, thoughts from Michael Schratt. They're worth every minute. Uh, again, he's the best there is. And he's a very, very dear friend of mine. And sometimes I think I'm embar I embarrass him when I, I talk about Aww. how much I appreciate what he does. And he does. He does just he does an incredible job. So when he's uh, when you're ready, we'll you know we'll bring him bring him on board. Yes, yes. Well, let's not make him wait. So we have our equally dashing guest today, Mr. Michael Schrad. Michael, how are you? Hello, good to see you. Good hey, to see you. you're looking good. Uh, yeah, right. Good to see both of you. 
We've yeah. got some real world boots on the ground research as we speak here. We're, we're doing it as we speak. So I love yeah. it. So what yep. are you doing? What, what are you covering? Doing? And uh, I won't stick around too long because it's a little bit loud out here, but I, I at least want to, you know, come here with both of you. What we're doing is we are drilling down on the Leonard Stringfield UFO crash retrieval cases. Wow. This is the compendium of basically all six, seven status reports in one bound volume. And uh, it's, it's just the best material because Leonard talked to firsthand military witnesses, pilots, air traffic controllers, astronauts, cosmonauts, people who worked on the UFO crash retrieval team, people who were involved in autopsies, people who were on the debris fields and then brought these craft onto 18-wheeler tractor trailer low boys and actually sent them to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. That's the level of credible eyewitnesses that Leonard had spoke to. But there's two problems with this book, and I want to highlight these problems. Number one, as you can see, there's virtually no pictures in this book. Mm. It's all text, so it's it's very it's heavy reading. The other problem is the agreement that Leonard had made with his contacts is he would maintain an important part of our national history by preserving the content of the story from the eyewitnesses, but he would not publish their names. He had to keep the names anonymous to protect their security. So that's why this book doesn't have any names in it. So after reading over this book multiple times, you know, it, it immediately dawned on me someone has got to do a very nice drawing of each of these cases whatever the cost is how long it takes it doesn't matter this is a legacy project that belongs to the whole world it's bigger than me it's it's bigger than all of us we we deserve to see what these cases look like so i'm going to hit you with four examples here while while we're all here yeah. we the best we could uh, it'll be kind of a world exclusive here but we, we took all the information from Leonard Stringfield, the historical legacy. We put that in an illustrative form. And I'm going to start here with something that, Jim, you should be very familiar with. Okay. Okay. So the, the date is January 28, 1986. And I know, Jim, that's a, <laughs> that's a, a special date for you. Yes, it is. And <laughs> yeah. we know that this is the Challenger accident. We lost seven astronauts, including Krista McCullough, who's the school teacher. But we also lost someone called Ellison Onizuka. He was a Challenger astronaut. Yeah. Now, in 1973, here he is right here. This is the guy we're talking about. Mm -hmm. In 1973, he was at McClellan Air Force Base. And he was with a group of other Air Force pilots, and they were brought into this briefing room unannounced, and the lights went down. All the lights went off, and there was kind of a military personnel in the back of the room that had a movie projector. And he turned on this movie projector and projected on the forward wall was this black and white, somewhat grainy film of two alien corpses on a slab or in a medical environment and you know he was looking at this and and he remembered himself saying oh my god this, these are like aliens on this slab he was shocked he was surprised 30 seconds later they turned off the movie projector and there was absolutely no debriefing whatsoever it's like the government was gauging the reaction of our top military pilots. Could they handle this new reality? Could they handle this new truth? So I work with my friend, Rudy Gardia. We tried to put the best available illustration together, showing these pilots inside of this briefing room with the movie being projected on the forward wall. And here it is right here. I hope you can see this, but this is, this is the drawing we came up with. And, uh, I'll actually try to take it out here because there's a little bit of a glare, so it'll be a little bit easier to see. But here's what the, uh, the drawing looks like. Wow, that's incredible. Yeah. And uh, I tracked down Mr. Onizuka's widow. I wrote her a letter. I have not gotten a response back yet. I don't know if I will, but that's how this rolls. We have to at least try. We have to try. If I can get it in, in written pen ink, 
that her husband actually did see this movie at McClellan Air Force Base in 1970. I think it's a breakthrough. I really think it's a breakthrough because we, we now have some documented evidence that this actually took place. And according to Leonard Stringfield, within these cases of his status reports, this is not the only time that this has happened. At least three other times he's got witnesses that have seen this film or something very similar to it where pilots, military personnel are brought into this briefing room. They're shown this strange film with bodies and craft, and then it's turned off and there's no briefing whatsoever. There's no briefing whatsoever. Now, let's continue on here to another case. This is 1952, we're at the Pentagon. And there is a, the primary eyewitness, she got in kind of to a lower level of the Pentagon. Now it, it doesn't explain exactly how all this went down, but she accidentally went into this room that was kind of off limits. It was dark, it was dusty. It was kind of, uh, they had some boxes off to the right and she kind of did a 180 and she looked off into the forward portion of this room And what did she see? What did she see? She saw, quote unquote, a pickled alien in a glass jar, approximately Stop. three feet tall. She actually saw it. No more than 10 seconds later, she felt this hand on her on her shoulder, and it was an MP. And he, in very strong language, he said, you do not belong here. Get out of here immediately. You're, you're not supposed to be here, whatever. And I've, I've copied the page from Leonard Stringfield's book so that we have a historical spec sheet. Now I want to give you what the drawing actually looks like that Rudy came up with. And here is the, uh, the latest drawing here. So you, hopefully this is coming wow. out okay here. And you can see the body here. So we have to think, where where are they keeping the bodies in the debris? We know the government does, they do not follow the single point failure, you know, way of action. They, they don't put all their eggs in one basket. So we've got repositories at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. We've got repositories at MacDill Air Force Base. We've got a repository at Homestead Air Force Base and Langley Air Force Base, Virginia. So there's separate facilities that are holding pens for bodies and craft. Okay, so let's keep moving on here. Now... We always talk about Roswell as being the first crash retrieval. Well, that's not true because Cape Girardeau was in 1941. That's six years before Roswell. We have another case which claim, came from Clark McClellan who states that he interviewed a gentleman who knew an Air Force courier who was delivering a letter, and this is at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, and when he went to, the, this is 1946, when he went to this Uh, hangar facility, he recognized a guard there. He recognized a guard who was a friend. And this friend said, hey, you want to come see something? So he brought him into the hangar. They went a little bit down this corridor. And then in this open part of the hangar, they saw about a 30-foot diameter dish-shaped craft. It had a central column from the bottom going up to the top. Around the outer circumference of the disc, there was about, you could say, 24 rectangular shaped cutout windows that they could look inside to see the central column off to the right there was a tarp that was folded up off to the left they had an electric drill with diamond tip drill bits and they were trying to pierce the windows with these diamond tip drill bits and this is now the fifth time i've heard about this where the united states government is is desperately trying to break and breach the hull of these craft. They, they're trying acetylene torches. They, they, they try diamond tip drill bits. They try uh, jackhammers, anything to get into these crafts. So here is the drawing that Rudy came up with. And you can see here the diamond tip drill bit. We've got the toolbox. We've got the off to the side here. We've got the tarp. And this is essentially exactly what the craft looked like. So this is 1946. By 1947, we could say that they had the Roswell craft, they had this craft, they had the 1941 Cape Girardeau craft, and if we're led to believe that something was retrieved in 1942 at the Battle of Los Angeles, we're looking at four or five craft by the time Roswell even hit. They've already got it. So when the government says that we're, we're lacking evidence, that's not true. 
They've got the evidence. They've got the evidence. They just they just don't want us to know. They don't want us. They, to they, know. They, they they afraid of the reaction. Have you ever been to read that into anything that's been published by the you know by the military or the the government? They said that one one of the concerns is that if a government acknowledged the existence of alien creatures and their craft, you know, even though every you know it, they. There, there's daily, if not weekly, reports of uh, sightings of things people can't explain. Mm -hmm. And even if 99.9% .9 of them are fake or swamp gas or something that they don't recognize, you know, that they just didn't recognize, all it has to be is one. That's my right. Fi my finger just disappeared. One. <laughs> right, right. And that's all we need. Yeah. And, so you, ha and you have, you know, four confirmed crashes we we have some good accounts of these now could there be a hoax in a, in all these cases sure absolutely but it just doesn't appear that all of them are hoaxes because they're overlapping and we've got independent confirmation that they're, they're definitely overlapping and what you were talking about jim is that we only need one that's that's true so if if we look at the crash retrieval cases there's about 120 of these in this book and if you went to vegas and you had a roulette wheel that had 121 slots and you bet on 120 of them, you're going to win every time, Jim. You're going to win every time. Yeah. You can't lose. You know, yeah. Yeah. all we need is one. That's all we need. Yeah. That's amazing. So you mentioned the Battle of L.A. Now, was there a crash retrieval from that? Because yes. I thought it's not it, talked about much, but they shot no. down something. They shot they, down something. Yep. Oh, that's fascinating because oh, you always hear it flew away, that, that nothing got shot down. They retrieved something. They don't talk about it much, but they they, they definitely retrieved something. And uh, we'll do we'll do a couple more here. I don't want to keep you too long. No, so this, these are amazing. Uh, it's 1953, you. Wright Patterson Air Force. All roads lead to Wright Patterson Air Force. Of course. <laughs> For some reason they always do. All right, so it's 1953, and this guard was at the right place. And he was at the right time at the right place. Uh, about 9 p.m., a C-54 comes rolling in, and the hangar doors are shut. And there's a forklift inside the hangar. There's military MP guards there. And the hatch on the port side of the aircraft opens up, and there's five wooden crates within the port side of the C-54. The forklift rolls up. The forks go up. They load the, the wooden crates on forks, and then the forks drop down. And this military MP that uh, Leonard Stringfield had talked to, he was within 10 feet of seeing these boxes. Now, there were two boxes below that were obscuring the ones on top. The ones on top were empty. They had their lids taken off. And he said that when he looked at these crates, he saw three, you could say about three to three and a half foot tall alien looking beings. One of them was female. He said that one of them was absolutely female. He could tell. And they had very slightly oversized heads, oversized eyes, slit for a mouth, minute nose, very minute uh, ears. They were wearing a one piece tight fitting flight suit and there was netting or fabric below them to keep them protected from the freezer burn of the dry ice. He mentioned that as well. So, we took all the information together the best we could from the Leonard Stringfield case. Uh, we look at the aircraft, we look at the cargo bay door, and here's the final rendering of what uh, we came up with here. So this shows you the bodies in there in the crates. And uh, here's the port side uh, cargo bay. And this is something that's happening at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, the 40s, the 50s, the 60s, into the early 70s. There, there has got to be something going on at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. There, there's just got to be. There's too many stories of, of right. going, being transported to Wright-Patterson Air There's just too much there. It's true. And maybe it's the underground, the alleged, un alleged underground facility. Uh, easy storage. I don't know, but you're right. I mean, even people, I mean, so I, you know, had my dad worked at Wright Pat for a while and I lived yeah. in the area and even contractors, they, they say there are, there are rumors that there are aliens at Wright Pat or an alien. I've heard different versions of it. So to this day, 
there are still these rumors about right pad it's that's fascinating correct. that's correct that's correct all right let's move on now it's 1955 and the primary eyewitness this this i love this story i love this story 1955 right patterson air force base the primary eyewitness was present when extraterrestrial debris and artifacts were quote unquote photographed bag tagged and then archived in a huge warehouse at wright patterson air force base and her job was to type up the uh the dossiers and the manifest of what came in and then these things were, were photographed there was a tag put on them and then they were put in into kind of like a ziploc plastic bag and then put on shelves so you can imagine this huge warehouse kind of like the closing scene in indiana jones raiders of the lost ark You've got all these boxes and crates and everything. But in this case, there were these shelving apparatus. And then tucked away in these shelvings and cupboards are these alien debris, boxes, uh, shrapnel, I-beam, propulsion systems. So we really dug down deep and we thought, you know, what would this warehouse look like? And she also mentioned that as she was typing at her typewriter, there was this cart that rolled by and there were two bodies onto the onto the cart as well so not only did she see and handle the debris she saw bodies as well and her, her final words were you know now that i'm near the end of my life what can uncle sam do to me so she let it all out she knew that you know this is her final legacy her final curtain call what's the government going to do they can't touch me anymore so I, i'm glad she told us so here is the uh inside the warehouse at Wright Patterson Air Force Base. And I'm gonna to try to zoom in here so you can see the, the propulsion system. You can see the bodies here that are being rolled. And then also the debris, uh, some of the propulsion systems, the, the I-beam. Who knows what the debris looks like? We can only guess the best we can, but again, coming from this lady, why would she lie? What's in it for her, you know? What's in it for her? Right. Especially, especially if, she, if she's the end of her life and she just, she, if she feels the world correct. has to know. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's That's just, correct. also, Wright Patterson has always been, uh, this has, the name of the org organization is the a Alien Technology Center. And I think they were referring, you know, more, you know, more to foreign, you know, Russian or Chinese uh, weapons and, and whatever. But there's all you know. There's there's a crash that was recovered. I think 2016, 2000, 2015, okay. uh, in in far you know, in, in the almost on the Arizona border in a remote area of New Mexico. And uh, yeah, I, I I drove I drove to uh, Glenwood, uh, New Mexico. I met with it was a fire marshal. It was Veterans Day 2015. That's all. That's what I remember. And I didn't, you know, I, I, I didn't have any provisions to go, you know, to go anywhere you know, and look for it. But I talked to the uh, fire marshal. I said, yeah, there's something that crashed here. Uh, you know, within 24 hours, they had, uh, they had s flatbed uh, truck. They had uh, uh, heavy, you know, heavy equipment. There was, you know. Th a half a dozen or or so white vans filled with people. They were they were in the area for three days, okay. and when they when they came out, they headed south. They didn't head uh, north like they're going to Kirkland. They headed south, and I don't know where they were going to go from there because the next the next base would probably be the Army facility at Fort Biggs in El Paso, uh, and they weren't heading towards White Sands, so. There was something. So uh, uh, Stuart Brown and I. Stuart used to be the uh, senior editor of Popular Science, and then he met me. But I was out visiting with him. He said, "Hey, we have to go. We have, we have to see what we can find." I drove down that the one road I thought uh, may have uh, where the crash site is, and I only went in, went in about six or seven miles. I was by myself. I didn't no radio, uh, no cell phone coverage. I didn't have any water with me, and I said, you know, if this, if, if my car breaks down or I get, you know, or something happens, I'm in the middle of nowhere. So I headed back, and you know, the following year, uh, Stuart and I went back 22 miles down this one road, and came to the conclusion on some of the bends and turns 
there's no way a semi or even a large vehicle could have made some of some of the you know some of the, the curves. So there has to be another there has to be another road going into the area, and you know we were all ready to go in in uh, 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 2019. The weather wouldn't cooperate. Next thing you know, it's 2020 and the world shut down. Yeah. So, but there was a report from uh, the Albuquerque Center, and they put they put up a uh, notice to airmen, and and there was a temporary flight restriction over that area. It's 30 miles from the uh, the center of the the longitude and latitude that they identified. And I I went to that the exact same location on the center of uh, of their restricted area, and that's sort of a uh, a campsite area. Uh, it's it's remote. It's it's remote backpacking and remote camping. There are no facilities, uh, and there was no. I mean, I went down every every road I could. Uh, you know, re a relatively short distance. And the, you know, the thing about the desert, and even though this, this is a wooded area, it's still the desert. It takes. It takes eons for it to recover if you've gone in there, made a, you know, made a road, or disturbed the area. So I have to. I have to, I'm gonna wait till it cools down a little bit. Probably it'll be a rainy, you know, rainy late summer, early fall. But we have we have to get. You know, get, wait for the motorcycle to go by. Yeah. Yeah, we have to we have to get a team, you know, team out there. I've been uh, I've been hoping to get someone. Who has some uh, wherewithal? Who has more money than brains to to help fund? You know, getting uh, maybe track vehicle. I've, uh, I, you know, I've con I've contacted a number of different people on the, and they expressed an interest. But again, uh, 2020, 2021, and now the first half of 2022 uh, has not been you know not been uh, kind to us. So. Uh, so we're going to do it eventually, but there is a, there is a site, and then the fire marshal said when everybody came out, they had they headed south. Okay. They had they had something on the flatbed truck. It wasn't very much debris, whatever it was, but mm -hmm. he was covered with a tarp. He said it was not more than a couple, three or four feet, yeah, but it said a couple of feet tall, and didn't look very big. But the the FAA had indicated that this thing hit the ground at three thousand miles an hour. Ooh. Wow. So That's yeah, you do you do that with yeah, you, know, you do that, you know, you're driving down a freeway and, and you 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 hit a dragonfly or a a, a pole bee or something. It, it makes a big splat and there's not much left of it. So it's probably what we're looking at. But it's huh. it's someplace that needs to be investigated. Mm -hmm. Right. So. Well, not great for the occupants, but maybe great for people <laughs> looking for stuff. Yeah. <laughs> there might yeah. be very tiny little pieces. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. So I know approximately where the area is. Uh, we need someone with a uh, who have a they have a commercial license for uh, your uh, drones with a you know with four with a four K uh, live feed and fly over the area because no matter what you do you're not you're not going to uh, they don't have enough people. To be on the ground, their hands and knees, picking through the debris, looking for every trace of evidence, right. and and usually the people that end up doing that are the are the flunkies or the lowest ranked people if they're in the military. Uh, a good example is when the first F-117 crashed uh, near Bakersfield. Uh, uh, Ross Mohair was Ross Mo, Mohair, I think. Or I think that's that correct. Good. That's correct, Tim. Yeah. Yeah, I. Uh, I actually ran into his father at an account of mine in Fallbrook, Mass. He was one of my accounts, and he had a picture of F-117 on the wall. And I said, "What do you know about the F-117?" I said, well, "I lost my I lost my son in one." Yeah. I said, "Is that the one that crashed in Bakersfield?" And his eyes got really big. He said, "You know about that?" And I said, "Yeah, yeah." All right, what do you? They figured he got tunnel vision because he was it was night flying, and he was flying with his. Uh, you know, just using his IRAD system, his infrared mm -hmm. uh, tracking system, and uh, he lost. You know, he lost where the uh, horizon was and clipped. You know, clipped the mountain, and that was it. But when when something like that happens, it's instant. Yeah. yeah. So you, you don't say, "Oh, did he suffer?" No. 
all of a sudden he was there next thing you know he was a splat yeah. so but it was it was interesting and he, you know, he told me that is that he didn't know much about it because his son wouldn't talk about it right but uh they did tell him uh what he was flying and what you know what uh and where it crashed so uh pete merlin who's a longtime friend of mine and he's an, an aeronautical archaeologist mm -hmm. He went into the area and it says relatively easy to find because there's burnt, burnt debris and other stuff. And you can see there was excavation. And he went in there with a metal, metal detector and pulled up a ton, not a ton, but a large amount, you know, several large boxes filled with debris. Wow. Because wow. a buddy of mine who was, who, was, who was in a position to know about those type of recoveries he said, you know, they're going to pick the, the lowest ranked person. They're going to be at their hands and knees. And, you know, they're, they're not going to, oh, that's not, that's not nothing. That isn't something, you know, and it's real easy for them to overlook stuff. Mm -hmm. So no matter, in, unless they dug up all the dirt in the crash site and hauled it off somewhere and sifted it and went through and pulled all the debris out, there's not going to be anything. So uh, Peter, you know, you know, Peter found, uh, traces there when the wind crashed near Holloman, there in Alamogordo, he, you know, he recovered pieces and parts from that one. And <clears throat> he's been really, really good at that. So there's, there's, there's going to be wherever, wherever the crash was, I would even say the Roswell crash, if someone were to go in there, put a grid down and, you know, literally check every square inch of that area for maybe a thousand feet by a thousand foot uh, right, impact right. area yeah. they're right. going to find they're going to find something because even even 70 years later or 65 years later there is going to be something left mm. yeah. so uh that's what you have to do that's what you have to do so uh, these are some fascinating stories though too michael that you have like i haven't heard some of these before and i love the details i think it was the not not the last one you told but maybe the one right before that with the the three bodies sure um, like the small little details like the netting under the body so they didn't touch the dry ice to yes. me that le that lends so much um credibility to the story i totally agree with you i totally agree with like you that. yeah that's that's Amazing. mentioned in the report so i i totally agree with you uh i think we got time for one more here yeah. so this is 1973 and a photographer who examines gun camera footage, he's brought to Norton Air Force Base and he's put on an Air Force vehicle. They drive an hour from Norton Air Force Base. And at that point, they stop over a platform and this platform drops down into the ground, probably about 150 feet into this underground, deep underground military base facility. At that point, he's met with another photographer. They both go into a room and they put on these white smocks, laboratory hazmat suits, full body, and they're all white. They're led into this other facility within this underground military base. And what do they see? They see this large crane and there's a cable coming down. And at the bottom of this cable, there's about a 30 foot diameter dish shaped craft that's suspended. It's supported in netting. And both of these photographers, they're put in a cherry picker and they're moved over to the entry hatch about this uh, dish shaped craft. They go inside and they're, what their job is, is to photograph the interior of this craft. And, and remember, it's suspended about 20 feet off the ground. It's 30 feet in diameter. And he was basically commissioned to photograph the buttons and switches and dials and gauges within the interior. But here's the really interesting part about it. He said that the craft was 30 feet in diameter, but when he got inside, he said that he could pick up and throw a football as hard as he could and he wouldn't hit the other side. It was the TARDIS. Well, I think I think Bob Lazar said the same thing about the. He sports did say model. the same thing. That's exactly correct. Wow. So it was, when, it, when he was on it, I mean, it was 30, 35 foot diameter. But when he when he looked, put his head inside the hatch and looked, he yes. said it was like looking into an auditorium. That's right. That's right. Yeah. And I thought, how are we going to illustrate this? Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You've probably seen that that Walt Disney cartoon or that Tom and Jerry cartoon where they're they're chasing around this 
teepee and they look inside the teepee and it's like cavernous. That's mm -hmm. how the interior of this craft was. And so I'm thinking, how in the world are we going to show a 30 foot diameter dish shaped craft? But then when you go inside of it, it's gigantic. Like you could throw a football all the way to the other side and you still wouldn't hit the inside wall. That's difficult to do. So yes, he also said that when he came out of the craft, he was brought back down on the cherry picker. He went into another room where they were performing an autopsy on three corpses. So we've got like a composite illustration here. And this is what Rudy came up with. Here you can see the craft with the crane. We've got the underground facility with the Meglev train. That checks out. We've got Los Angeles Times uh, newspaper articles. So here's the craft in the netting. And then we'll zoom down here and we'll try to get inside here. Hopefully you can see the interior of the craft. We've got some uh, gauges and panels here. And then off to the side, this is the autopsy that was being performed here. And he did say that there was some fluids coming out, but this is uh, what we came up with relatively recent uh, illustration. So hopefully it'll be a, a world exclusive for you. <laughs> That's amazing. Oh my gosh. That's incredible. That's a lot going on in one. Like, yep. just let's start there. That's a lot. <laughs> All in one area. Holy mackerel. Now, yeah, even, even though there aren't any names in the, in the book, you know, the craft uh, retrieval. He knows the names. And uh, the 22 bank boxes of, of material has the names, but they will not release the original letters and so we just have to go by the status reports i mean we've got the story we just don't have the name to tie it to that's all is, is there is there any way through a back door or a three you know do another research to try to identify who it, what and where it might be but it's going to be hard and you know like stanton friedman always said that we're chasing the undertaker and and we are chasing the undertaker some of these accounts are 50 60 years old now we're we're way past chasing the undertaker that's why these drawings have got to be done now so that we maintain an important part of our national history. We might be able to find some of these witnesses. If we can tie the witnesses to the drawings and to the account, we can go to Congress, we can subpoena these witnesses, and we can perhaps get this physical evidence because that's what it's gonna take to move this field forward. We need these crash retrievals, we need the debris, we need the bodies. That's what it's gonna take. Have, have you? Yeah. Are you aware of any congressman or probably not senators, but any congressman or woman that has a strong interest in uh, UF, uh, UFOs, UAPs? That, that would be Greer's territory. That would be okay. Greer's territory. Offhand, I don't. I'm small fries. But, uh, you know, the, the time is now. You can feel that there's a the vibe is correct for this material to come forward. We just need the real evidence. That's all we need, and we're 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 on automatic pilot at that point. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm yeah. If anybody if anybody could find it, it's going to be Michael. <laughs> yeah. And, Absolutely. Uh, what I'm amazed too by this is how many bodies and autopsies there are in these stories. Right. The number count just keeps going up. It's amazing. It just keeps going up. It just keeps going up. <laughs> So and, how and, many bodies do we actually have on ice at this point in time? Yeah, I know. They're spread out in different locations. For sure, they're spread out. I know they don't keep them all at one location. They definitely want to safeguard it because they know that these are the crown jewels. They know this could change the course of history. If it came out, we could we could take the oil industries out overnight. We could take the coal fire plants out overnight with this technology. Right. Not that they will, but they could. Not that they will, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it seems like, I mean, that's, that's the same with, you know, with illnesses and diseases, mm -hmm. you know, the, the medical community, they don't want to come up with, with a, uh, right. Uh, uh, a shot or you know, some type of pill you can take that would cure cancer or, you know, I cure know. diabetes or no, re that's bad regrow, business for big pharma. regrow a limb or whatever. Uh, but we, you know, it's, we're we're probably there are probably some areas in, uh, of technology that, like Ben Ritz said, if you see movies like Star Trek or Star Wars, we've been there, done that, or decided it wasn't worth the effort. Uh, you know, the tricorder where you go over you know over someone's body. I mean, they. You know, what difference 
when, when you when you look at uh, an MRI type of, type of event, or when I had when they were looking for blockage when I thought I had a heart attack, it was just two flat screens going over me after I had uh, my stress test, and they were able to determine the fact I had absolutely no blockage, and so that's yeah that's almost it wasn't something you put in your pocket, but when the first cell phones came out, you had it you know this ten pound battery you carried with you with a cord and a, and the brick as they would call it. So it's just a matter of time until until we come up with that type of technology. So, and again, there was a there was a meme on uh, I saw that yesterday or today that said uh, the the library has 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 changed has moved science fiction from uh, you know, from uh, oh uh, yeah from, you know from just uh, fantasy to. Uh, Nonfiction yeah. section, non nonfiction. Yeah, go from from fiction to nonfiction. Okay, yeah. and it's it's you know, even yeah you know, even when you you'll just look at Jules Verne for example, and his submarine, the you know the Nautilus, and his his trip you know his flight to the moon. When you when you look at the type of equipment that he was seeing, they had to be used, and they try to backtrack and calculate it into modern day technology. He was right about the amount of thrust needed, the size of the capsule, the whole bit. I mean, it's and, I, and every every time I see, see uh, the uh, uh, was it uh, Jules Verne's uh, movie it was a 1930s vintage or even earlier than that, uh, black and white going you know his trip to the moon. It just when someone's looking back there, how can how can this ever possibly happen? And then of course uh, you know. Uh, you know the you know the first landing was uh, Apollo 11, so it's we're just we're just waiting for, we're just waiting for you know, for that for you know, the science fiction that we've read about when we've seen in movies like Star Trek and Star Wars and uh, uh, to, to become to become common every, everyday events and exactly. technology. Exactly. It's just yeah, it's going to be a different world. It's going to be a different world if we get there. It'd be amazing. We can get around. I'm curious so how many so we you had mentioned earlier it always comes back to Wright Pat how many how many of these cases does Wright Pat come into play uh well the book I wrote back in 2013 I had 119 cases yeah so if we factor in the majority of them went there and then the other ones went to McDill Avon Park Langley Air Force Base Homestead Air Force Base it seems like a high number but yeah I do, just don't think all these witnesses are lying. I no. don't think lying. I mean, we're talking dozens of craft, dozens of bodies. Right? So. It's like a processing plant. My God. Yeah. yeah, yeah. One, of, one of the things uh, my dear late friend John Lear told me, he said when he was, uh, when he was flying you know, all over the planet, he would track down people that claimed to be abductees. Mm -hmm. And he would con he would also contact the closest university to to find someone from their uh, psychological department, uh, someone who's cert who has a, either a master's degree or or a PhD in regressive hypnos hyp hypnosis. And I don't know if he'd compensate uh, the you know, the people who agreed to be hypnotized, but he did pay for the doctors and yeah. everything else. And he had 15 people that he had uh, put under hypnosis at, scattered all over the country. Not, none of them had ambient temperature IQs to speak of. Uh, I mean, they were all double digits. They weren't, you know, triple digits. They had no, they had no interaction. They had no knowledge of each other. And that was one thing he wanted to make sure that when he was uh, putting this package together, that there was no collusion. And of the thir of the 15 people that he had hypnotized, 13 of them had almost the exact same experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if you ever if you ever get into you know, John's files, I, all that stuff is in there. Wow. And, That's fascinating. And he said two of them of of the 13, 13 of them I mean, of the 15, 13 were authentic, and there were there were two that were trying to pull the wool over your eyes. And he said mm -hmm. it was. It was very, very evident. You know, they, uh, uh, if you don't want to be hypnotized, you can't, I don't think you can be. Um, no, you can't. 
I've I been hip- progressive hypnosis on people. <laughs> uh, I've, I've been hypnotized about a dozen times. Mm-hmm. And I'm a, I'm a real good candidate for it because I know it works. And uh, you know, when, I, when I first quit smoking, I went and got hypnotized. And uh, a buddy of mine who was an anesthesiologist, you know, Doc Weir, he said, he said, how long has it been since you quit smoking? I said, well, it's been uh, 40, you know, 40 some odd years. He said, hypnotism, when it comes to breaking a habit, usually lasts 60 to maybe 90 days. And after that, uh, you're going to you're going to revert back to what you what you were doing unless unless you have m- made it clear into your, your subconscious that I'm quitting period so uh, I had that done and I've also had it you know just uh, you know other other events where I was hypnotized and I guess I hypnotized real easy mm. and, and I have uh, I have tapes weight loss tapes a CD that I will put me to, will put me to sleep okay uh, so uh, that's, it's it's a it's a fascinating thing, and you can't and it, you really can't make someone do something they don't want to do under hypnosis. No, but can't. if but if someone really really disliked me and uh, and they and they truly in their heart of hearts wanted to kill me, and someone hypnotized them, said I want you to kill Jim Goodall, uh, they may do it because it's it's not against it's not against their core principles. So, but we have to yeah you got to got to track down. Uh, at least one one key person or a relative of key person of, of literally all the events that you, you know the you know the five mm-hmm. that you that you uh, uh, delightfully showed us today and yeah, it's amazing yeah and I'm uh, I'm look I'm looking forward to coming out and spending some you know, either you coming out here or me going out yeah. there and spending some time with you Michael so sounds um, good yeah. do any of the cases overlap yes they have overlap yeah because we're we're getting independent reports from different people, different locations that are describing the same features, components, and methods of trying to breach the whole of these crafts. So I would say, yes, they're, they're definitely overlapping. It's amazing. Uh, yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we're going to get back to the drawings. I'll, I'll sign off, but uh, thank you very much. Oh, thank Mike. you so much, Michael. And thank you for sharing the drawings. They're amazing. I can't wait to see more. My privilege, my privilege. All right, Michael, I'll talk to you later. Okay, Lynn. Bye, Jim. Yep. Take care. Adios. Bye. Bye. Oh, my goodness. That's amazing. That was so cool to see those. Michael is, a, as far as I'm concerned, a national treasure when it comes to doing UFO research because he doesn't interject his personal thoughts or feelings Mm -hmm. uh, into uh, what he does. Yeah. And he just does and... uh, yeah, Michael Schratt is awesome. He and, is. Yeah, and I'm just absolutely. Was that the husband? You just. Oh, that was my husband. Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Congratulations. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> See what they get. They only ever congratulate the bride, but the groom. Yes, that's right. The groom needs to, you know, something to. Yeah. Now, uh, Mr. Overlander wants mm-hmm. the book. Yes. Well, his first book is amazing too. Uh, if anybody hasn't gotten it, I'm going to actually grab the link. Yes, Dark Files. It's so good. And this and is, this I is book one. And, yes. Hulk, and he has enough to do probably a hundred of these. And this, I think he said it covers uh, 75 or so uh, different programs. I mean, different, uh, different retrievals, different crashes. So, mm-hmm. so so good i'm gonna hold on i am gonna grab here i am it's on amazon anybody who wants it i highly highly recommend absolutely. it it's absolutely so good. It's, it's it's worth it's worth every penny yeah uh this and this and and the thing about it the illustrations he has in there brings it all to life mm-hmm. uh, right now he's uh, i i think the one artist that did a lot of his uh uh Colored illustrations. I don't know if I don't know if that was uh, uh, Mark McCandish. Of course, he's uh, he left us here a couple of years oh, ago, yeah. uh, which is which is sad. But uh, yeah, the the quality of the of the work, the qu- and and the fact that he has all the supporting documents on each chapter, 
make it makes it something if you if you're into uh, if you're into UFOs, UAPs, things that go bump in the night, mm -hmm. you have no choice but to uh, you know to, to buy the book. And it's, it's so it, good. It's worth every penny. Yeah, you know? absolutely. And again, no one does it better than Michael. Nobody. Oh, good. YJ Overlander yeah. just bought it. Yes. Oh, okay. You'll love it. You'll yeah. love it. It's yeah. so good. And if uh, I, I know he's going to, he told me he was going to uh, bring a uh, a large number of maybe 100, maybe 200, but I think it's just 100 uh, to the uh, MUFON uh, symposium in Denver uh, in the you know, beginning of July. I think it's mm -hmm. the 7th, 8th, 9th, and 10th or something like that, but it's in De it's in Denver. Uh, so if you want one signed and autographed by Michael, uh, I got, I got, I got the first one to be sent off to anybody Wow! and autographed by Michael. And, uh, he also dedicates the book to me, which I, I don't deserve, but yes, you do. Uh, I, I am thrilled. I pushed him on, uh, pushed him to do this and a, a couple other key people did. And, uh, I just, he's an, he's a treasure. That's yeah. all. That's the best way I can describe Michael. He's, he's a, he's a true treasure and I'm honored to be his friend. Oh, he's, he is wonderful. As are you, you guys are yeah. uh, wonderful together too. You make such an amazing team. And I just want to say Akashi, Chris, where were all the women for Michael in the chat that you said you were going to get for us? I mean, Michael is an absolute doll. We need to get these women for him. I mean, right. he's, He's he's intel he's intelligent. He's very he's very very conservative in his in any anything and everything he does. Mm -hmm. um, you know he doesn't drink. He doesn't smoke. Um, you know, he's never done drugs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Even though the cousin brothers and I managed to uh, help him go to sleep when we were uh, in up in Phoenix. Uh, you know, Dr. Greer was here for uh, yeah. for a gathering. And then we ended up, uh, the cousin brothers had rented a, a two bedroom or three bedroom uh, townhouse. And we went there and, and of course he, he didn't participate in, in uh, what we were doing, but he had a poor sweet Michael secondhand high off a of weed now. Oh, did you? Yeah. <laughs> he, he said he has a hard time going to sleep as, as yeah. do I, my, my brain will not shut down. Mm -hmm. I lay in yeah. bed and it's then the I, some, sometimes I'll get out of bed and go, you know, Go come back into the office and, and turn you know, turn my computer on and said, and go look at something because something something just got got hold of my brain and went like this. It's okay, yeah. get your butt out of bed and go take a look at this. Yeah. Um, and I've always had that problem. Michael has the same problem. Uh, his yeah. his brain never shuts down. But he said he he hit the bed and he was gone. He probably, said, he probably had the yeah, best yeah. sleep of his life. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so, I told him, I said, hey, I don't want you to become a pothead. But you that's know, if right. You, if, oh, good. Uh, yeah, in California, it's legal. In Arizona, yeah. it's legal. It's legal here, and, too. Yeah, it's legal here. Yeah. Chris said they didn't make the first round of background checks. Let's. That's good. Let's be very picky with Michael. He deserves yes. only the best. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. So. Oh, that's hilarious, though. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So what else is cooking? Well, you know what? I want to talk about something on my mind has been driving me crazy. And okay. I may get some flack for it from the UFO community, but I don't really care. So do you know who Travis Taylor is? Yeah, I know the name. Okay. Well, Travis Taylor, I love him. I've always loved Travis, loved him for years. He was evidently the head scientist. I think he just retired. I don't know. I'm trying to like, <laughs> Chris is saying, oh no, here we go. Cause she knows. Oh, my husband too. Uh, <laughs> they know me well. <laughs> Break, break out the gasoline and the matches. Huh? That's right. That's right. So, yeah. So he evidently was the head scientist. Travis Taylor has like 2,700 degrees. I always say I love the man because he has 2,700 degrees, but the man still says UFO. My kind of guy. I love it. So he evidently was the head scientist for the UAP task force, the new one. And um, I, I believe the interview we were watching, he said he recently retired or he's retired now, but now everybody's giving him flack because he didn't come out while he was the head scientist for the UAP task force and that he, they, they can't trust him because he's a liar and a fraud. And I say poo poo on you people who are saying that because 
for goodness sakes. What makes everyone think they are so, and I love you all, I'm saying this all with love, what makes everyone think they're so entitled that they need to know everyone's resume the moment that they're doing it? What makes the U UFO community so entitled that they think they deserve to know all the information? Well, I mean, it is, there's, a, there's also a, a, a problem with, if, he had a, if he's, if he's you know, in fact, we're doing research by, for the government on uh, UFOs, flying saucers, and I hate the term UAP. I mean, it's, I did too. Yes. So did I, I, I talked to him about that actually at the UFO Disclosure Symposium. I was like, Travis, you better bring back the UFO because he's yeah. on Skinwalker yeah. Ranch. And yeah. I was like, I need the UFO. No, none of this UAP nonsense. But one, one of the, one of the problems when you're when you have been involved in a highly classified program, mm -hmm. I mean, there's 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 people that are still alive that were on the original U two production line there in Bakersfield, actually or Oral Oriel Dale there near yeah. Bakersfield back in the fifties. I mean, they're in their nineties and they're old and decrepit and they're ready to you know to call it quits. But they still won't talk about it because yeah. they they sign they send some documents and that they will take this knowledge to their grave. Yeah. And if you if if you decide that you want to violate that, if, you know, there there may there may be consequences that you and I are not aware of. Right. No, that is very true. No, That's very yeah. true. And uh, Akasha Chris is saying I I don't think he should be branded as a double agent. That's what they've been calling him, a double agent, which is ridiculous to me. Maybe the man couldn't talk about it, as you're saying. Maybe he couldn't. And and there, you know, there there may, yeah. Who know? Who knows what evil lurks in the minds of some of these security people? Mm -hmm. I mean, they could make his life a living hell if he were to if he were to uh, release information. Maybe they could make. Maybe they could cancel his. Uh, uh, you know his retirement and everything else associated with being a you know, you know federal government employee of mm -hmm. sorts or whatever, or uh, freeze his his bank account, his four hundred one k and savings account and everything else. They can make the federal government really wants to come down hard on you. They can. Yeah. I mean, a, a good example. I mean, it's not coming down hard, but a good example is is Bob Lazar. Mm -hmm. Yes. I mean, I, I, I had his social security number at one time on his W-2. Of course, that got shredded. Right. But, uh, but I, I just punched it in to verify what, you know, who it belonged to. And it came back, this number had never been issued. That's crazy. Wow. And, and but if, if, if the federal government want, wants to put, you know, tighten the screws on you, they have every means possible. They could, you know, they could empty yeah. out your bank account. They can destroy your credit. They can, you know, foreclose in your house. They can abscond with your, your vehicles. They can affect your children. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are, there are, you know, there are people within our, within our government. I know get a lot of joy out of destroying people. Yeah. And that's what that's what could be done. And and if if he has that hanging over his head, he, he may wait until he's on his deathbed. Yeah. And he may he may be holding a very very thick binder, much like Michael's binders. Maybe mm -hmm. holding on to that when he passes, when it says, "This is for Michael Schrat." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, Let's hope. Yeah, but people people who don't talk, I mean. One of the reasons one of the reasons I was successful in putting together a history of the Blackbirds. Mm -hmm. There's still people who worked on the production line back in this back in this you know late 50s, early 60s, and even worked in you know operational areas where they won't talk about it. Said so, said so that's classified. And I haven't I have not been told personally or gotten a letter to the fact that I I no longer have to abide by my security clearance, which said that I will take it to my grave. Mm. Now that's, that is the greater generation thinking. Yeah. Uh, I think, uh, and even my generation, I'm 77. I'm, mm. uh, I'm just right at the, uh, I just passed the, mm -hmm. the greatest generation, but I don't know. It, it, it's too important for anybody out there. And, and if anybody here is listening and you, and you want, and you do have firsthand or 
hard evidence of anything has to do with alien UFOs or whatever, now's the time to come out. Now's the time to get hold of, get hold of Michael, get hold of Lynn, get hold of me, get hold of uh, Dr. Greer. Yeah. Uh, somebody, somebody who has the, uh, who has the horsepower to stay above the fray, mm -hmm. who is independent to the point where he doesn't have to worry about the, the federal government coming down, putting the screws on you. Yeah. And someone, and you know, Dr. Gers, you know, the ideal person, because he, you know, he was never in that environment as, mm -hmm. uh, uh, as part of his day-to-day -day life. Yeah. So, and and he's fairly immune to that, as as am I when it comes to some things. When I'm working on, you know, it, it, when I did the book on the F-117, that really pissed everybody off in the in the security community. And boy, how in the hell did you get that information? I started digging. <laughs> And and that's what makes you know Michael stuff is so great. He, yeah. His books and his presentation on, on Blue Room Media, mm -hmm. all that has to do is strike a note with somebody, one person yeah. who may know, who has a relative or uh, a family member or a dear friend or whatever, or knows the name of the person that was part of the you know where their name has been redacted. Mm -hmm. from from you know, from all the crash retrievals maybe yeah that, maybe that person maybe there's a person that that knows who some of these people are and that some of these people are still still with us yeah Stuff I mean, back, retrievals back in the 40s no yeah. the 50s right. no but they may ha be like the children of those people and they remember hearing stories that their parents yeah. said yeah. or what have you yeah but, but it's not, i mean it's not it's nothing like a first hand yeah. experience yeah but and you're right. I mean, like in his first book, I think I told you I was looking through it and I saw the bubble UF, like the UFO that looked like a bubble, literally a bubble. Yeah. And that was an experience that I had. And I'd never heard anybody say that before. And I always kind of kept that one to myself because it was a little weird. Let's be honest. Yeah. Sounds weird to say you're flying around in a bubble. And I saw that and it's just like I got chills from head to toe. And I was like, oh, my God, that's what I was in. So it's very possible that someone will have an experience like that. Absolutely, yeah. where they can say, "Hey, that was me," or "I know this person." Yeah, yeah, it's so cool. Sure. But the thing with Travis Taylor that's amazing is like what you were saying. Like he is one of those people because he was at the UFO Disclosure Symposium in Utah that I was at. Akashi Chris was at. Um, Alien Girl One 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 was at. My husband David Hurley was at. Um, and Dave is like making a very good point because Travis did an amazing, oh, I wish you had been there, Jim. You would have loved it. An amazing presentation. And uh, Dave is saying, not to mention, you got a government guy proving to you via math that UFOs or UFOs are real. Isn't that what we wanted? Yes. He took the gimbal video and it was just the one released to the public, though he has said in an interview, he's seen, you know, he's obviously seen the full length videos. He's gotten more sensor data than we have. But he took even the one that the public saw and he did all of these different mathematical calculations looking at the heat signature, comparing it to uh, the exhaust on an F-18. And he was talking about how because it was so I can't remember the term he used where it's just so hot that it it's it like it's just black. You know, it, it, it doesn't give you the correct shape. And that's what he was saying was happening with the gimbal is that it's so hot that what we're seeing isn't the actual shape of the object itself. It's just that's how it's showing up on the FLIR because of the intense amount of heat. And he was able to, he also has a, um, I think he has a, a master's in, in, in um, optical physics and he's working on his PhD. And, and so he was able to know, okay, well, we know this is the type of camera that was used. And he was kind of able to go back and sort of figure out how this thing was constructed, even though it's proprietary. And uh, someone, I think, I don't know who made it. It was either Lockheed or Grumman or something. And they were kind of like, oh, they probably won't be too thrilled that you kind of figured out how this works. Um, and so he was able to figure it out. And, and knowing that, do all of these different mathematical equations about the trajectory, the speed, the, like, the, um, the, the heat signature, like, so many different things. He had graphs and charts and equations and stuff that just went way above my head. But it was like when you're sitting there listening, you're just like, 
holy mackerel, this makes total sense. And he's actually going to be publishing this. He's writing up an article uh, about it. So this is exactly the type of thing we need. The type of, the, yes, thank you, Rodrigo. So hot, it saturates the image. Thank you. Yes, saturates. That's the word I was looking for. Um, and yeah, so he was looking at the fighter plane versus the gimbal. The gimbal, the only thing on the fighter plane that was as hot as the gimbal was the exhaust. That was the only thing. Mm -hmm. And the entire gimbal was that hot. Um, it was just incredible, some of the things. And yeah, he was saying that uh, we don't have any material that would be able to handle that much heat consistently throughout the entire craft. Mm -hmm. um, he, I think he calculated that it was hot enough. And, and Chris and Dave, you guys were there, so correct me if I'm wrong. Hot enough to melt uh, aluminum, hot enough to melt steel, hot enough, uh, whatever the planes are made out of on all the different parts. Yeah, besides composite, primarily aluminum. And at 700, 750 it gets really soft and, and you can melt. So anything above a thousand degrees, you know, the airplane would just, uh, I mean, they may base, there, there are components in an airplane that wouldn't melt you know, yeah. anything, titanium, uh, certain types of uh, uh, iron uh, elements that uh, are, are designed to withstand heat and pressure. So, uh, yeah, I can't remember. He calculated what the temperature, what he believed the temperature would be. And it was just an insane amount. I mean, it was pretty crazy. And he was looking at, uh, there was something about the aura, I think, of the gimbal um, that told him I'm the worst person to be retelling this. Uh, but I cannot wait. Let me just say, I can't wait until this presentation comes out and the, and the paper itself, the article comes out and he's publishing it because he's going to be uh, he's in the process of getting it like peer reviewed, I think, and publishing. I can't wait till this comes out because it was, I mean, to me, this presentation was the highlight of the UFO symposium. It was so good and so amazing. And now knowing this was the head scientist of the UAP task force, the man started out his presentation by saying, if, <laughs> you say, if it looks like a UFO and it moves like a UFO, it might just be a damn UFO. Like that's how we started it out. So this is the head scientist of the UAP task force. That's the kind of guy we need doing this stuff. Yeah. Yeah. You know, someone who's open-minded enough to say it might just be a damn UFO. And yeah, it, it, it may, it may take some military brass who, mm -hmm. you know, fed up with, you know, with hiding all the information to finally say, you know what? Yeah. I'm tired of this. You know, I've chased them in whatever type of aircraft I've, you know, I've, you know, I've, uh, videotaped them using high resolution onboard uh, cameras. You know, the F-14 had a very, very powerful uh, D model, had a very powerful camera in the, in the nose underneath the chin. And it was good for low light and uh, infrared and other things. But it was, it was, I don't know if it was equivalent to 4K that we have today, but most of the technology we have in consumer electronics you know, something new, you know, G whiz thing just came out. It's probably been within the government and using the military, either ours or somebody else's military uh, for at least a decade. There's, there's nothing, there's nothing when you get in, when there's something new that hits the, uh, you know, hits the airwaves. Oh, this is, this is the new uh, uh, gold plated left hand widget and it'll do this and that. Yeah. Well, maybe, maybe we, you know, the, our government has been using it for the last 10 years doing, you know, doing something uh, totally different. So the, every, everything has a, a, a due date when it's, you know, when it's really, when it comes to pass, but it, but there's another date in there when it's finally released to the public. Yeah. And, some, and sometimes it's, it's decades. I mean, the yeah, best, best example is, is my passion, which is the Blackbird. Yeah, the A twelves were out, flew from uh, the twenty sixth of uh, April, nineteen sixty two, to the very last one. I think it was on the twenty first of June, nineteen sixty eight. It wasn't until nineteen eighty eight, twenty years after these airplanes were mothballed and you know put you know put to bed there at Lockheed, there at site two. It was 20 years before they admitted the existence of the single place CIA version of the Blackbird, the A-12. Mm. And if people, you know, if people who knew about it way back when, they didn't say a word. I mean, 
there was an there was an American. I think I think I mentioned this before. There was an American airline pilot flying from New York to San Francisco, or New York to LA. I think it was New York to San Francisco, mm-hmm. and over over Utah or whatever. They as they're flying, there's a you know there's a an F one. I mean a an A twelve is is accelerating and and taken off. It maybe just hooked up with a tanker. And the uh, chase plane you know, got the end number off the uh, off the United or I think it was a United or American flight. And they arrived in San Francisco, and the you know the airplane was stopped away from the gate. Uh, security people from our federal government came on board uh, and inquired to you know to all the passengers, mm-hmm. uh, have they seen anything unusual? And I, no one said anything. I don't think anybody was looking. Yeah. But they went in and they, they took the cockpit crew, which was a pilot, co-pilot, radio man, navigator, flight engineer. I think it was th- three or four in the cockpit back, you know, back in the you know, early 60s. Yeah. This is before automation. And they kept them for five hours. They, they had them all in different rooms and they interrogated them of what they said and what they did. And at the, at the end, they said, OK, you didn't say anything. And if you say anything, you're going to be in deep kimchi. So six months later, the same pilot with a different first officer is flying the same route and they see an A-12 mm-hmm. and the, uh, uh, you know, the first officer, oh my, look at that, I got my camera, I'm going to take a picture. And he said, don't bother because they're going to take your film. <laughs> and I hope you didn't have any plans when we, light it, light, you know, when we landed in San Francisco because we're going to be <laughs> interrogated for the next five or six hours. Oh God! <laughs> so, uh, and sure, like, sure. Can you guys just not fly it near us? Could you possibly right. do that? We got things to do. Right, and uh, you know, I'm always looking out the window if I'm, you know, if yeah. if it's daylight. I just, yeah, I, I'd like, I'd like to look. I mean, I'd look down yeah. and I'd try to figure out where we're at. Oh, I've been down that road, and what the hell are they doing over? What are they building over there? And this and that, or maybe see other aircraft. So it's always fun. Mm-hmm. But there, there are some consequences if you see something you're not supposed to. So the best thing yeah. to do, if you're in a, a commercial flight going somewhere and you see something and it's really cool and you take a picture of it, keep it to yourself until you get home. And yeah. Then get, <laughs> and then get hold, get hold of Lynn or get hold of myself <laughs> or Michael right. and say, hey, this is what I have. Uh, I shot it. I shot it in 4K on my on my my super duper. Uh, yeah, Sanyo or Samsung, whatever it is. Uh, yeah, G2 it's okay to be like, you didn't get it from yeah. me because we'll yeah. get, we don't want to be in interrogation for right, like 27 right. hours. Yeah. <laughs> so we do have a couple of pilots in our audience. I know that. Yeah. Um, you know, you know, one of the interesting things, if you're talking about melting steel, yeah. Back, back in the early 80s, I was at a place called Terra, the Terminal Explosive Research Administration. Mm-hmm. And they're based out of Socorro, New Mexico. It was about 40 miles south of uh, Albuquerque. Mm-hmm. And they they typically do all the non-nuclear weapons testing as far as the effectiveness. Mm-hmm. And I was there primarily to recover some equipment off of a Northrop F-89 Scorpion. They had five of them in there. And it's they, they bring they would bring in train loads of 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 uh, retired aircraft from Davis Monthan. They bring him in there and they were stacked up like cordwood and they would pull them out. They'd run engines and they'd, sh- they'd shoot them with various weapons to see what happens to them or uh, throw something in the inlet to, you know, s- see what the FOD can do to the engine. If they want to disable the engine and shoot up something with a bunch of uh, rocks, for example. Mm-hmm. And so the airplane runs into it. how much damage could it do? But there was a, uh, there was a fixture with a chunk of steel. It was about four foot by four foot. Mm-hmm. And the steel was 10 to 12 inches thick. Hmm. And it was like someone had gotten a, I'd have to say a bowling ball, but made of titanium or steel or whatever it is, heated it white hot and dropped it on this, on this 10 inch thick steel because there's a burnt hole all the way through it. And I, I asked the guy, I said, what the hell burnt that hole? He said, you didn't see it. Huh. I said, I don't know, it's right over there. I said, no, you didn't see it. And I said, okay. 
Oh, like, oh yes, yes, right. I did not see that. This is back in the eighties. I mean, they had. Uh, uh, I mean, it's some contract. We used to go in there and get parts. That was uh, you go in there escorted, uh, and you can take parts of of, of, of aircraft that they're going to scrap, or are no longer are useful to the people at uh, the Terminal Explosive Research Administration. Now they've changed the name of it. I don't know what it's. I don't know what it's called today, but. Mm -hmm. But in the later 80s, some contractors went in and took out a couple truckloads of, of pieces and parts and sold them to, to countries or people that they weren't supposed to get. And mm -hmm. like all things, the federal government, one person screws up, so we're going to punish everybody. So they, they put a total ban of anybody going in there recovering any of the equipment. And they also brought in shredders portable you know, shredders on the back of you know, uh, uh, semis to start shredding everything that they no longer use. I mean, there's, there's, there's historical aircraft in there that, uh, you know, if, if some museums or some researchers needed to get hold of, they're there, but they're, you know, those, that stuff is all being ground up into uh, scrap metal yeah. and taken off to the smelter. So it's, it's, I don't know. It, it only takes one person to screw things up. Mm. And I you know it's it's like 9-11. I used to, I'm, I'm a real good talker. You probably mm. haven't figured that out. You know, you're so silent. Stop, you're shy. And, <laughs> yeah, and well, I was, I was terribly shy when I was young. I couldn't, yeah. I couldn't talk to a good looking girl. Oh. Uh, I mean, I almost wet my pants if I had to talk to, I mean, someone like you in, in high school, I could not go up to you and, and ask you out. I Aww. just, I just, I was terrified of women. Aww. I got over that. But, yeah, clearly, yeah. I know you have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> now be nice, be nice. Uh, uh, so it's, uh, I don't know. It's, uh, we need, we just, we just, we just need to crack the code on how to get somebody who has direct knowledge with proof, stuff that can be verified that it's hasn't been altered, hasn't been changed, and it's real. And it's not gonna, I mean, it is all it's gonna take is is one event. Mm -hmm. If the right people do it and it's done properly, and depending on the equipment, and depending on the people out there that you know that have maybe have you know been listening to us or in all the rest of uh, you know the UFO type podcasts. Maybe they say, you know, I, I did I, I did this and such and such back in the day. It keeps me awake at night because it's so outrageous. And I, you know, I keep you know, hearing references to it and the references aren't quite correct. I really feel I should come out and uh, make, make it, you know, set the record straight. And hopefully, hopefully there's going to be somebody like that out there. I, yeah. And hopefully, and ho hopefully that you know they won't you know they won't pay the price for it, right? Yeah. I mean, because no, there, there, there's people here that get that will get pissed off at somebody because someone tells the truth. Oh my god! Yeah. And they'll well, we're, let's go protest their house or you know, set their car on fire or do something like that because they said something that they, you know, someone else didn't agree with. And I think and I think our federal government uh, is the one that's having the temper tantrum when it comes to things needing to be declassified and shown yeah so. yeah yeah well that's the thing is they always hide under the guise of national security right like how many of these things are actually I, I understand national security i get that concept but no no, mm -hmm. no one no one understands national security because the majority of the programs that are kept classified well beyond their sell date yeah or use date it's a game yes it's a game and it also classified programs can mask where and how much money is being spent oh for sure well black I mean, budget alone is just obviously the uh i think it was an either the national reconnaissance office or the national security agency one, one of the three lettered uh, spook organizations they were doing an audit of their books and they realized that in one of their slush funds for doing things they had six billion dollars in it. I mean, I'd like to find a slush fund that I had forgotten about that had 
six hundred dollars in it. Let alone. Or how about giving it back to the people who gave it to them in the first place? Oh no, no, that's uh, no. They only they only lend that to us. Right. When we when we we when we work and put stuff in savings accounts and and whatever. Right. Said, but as far as a lot of as for a lot of the uh, blood suckers in the federal government, mm-hmm. you know they're you know they're not going to relinquish that uh, that power, and that's what it is. It's power. Yes. Yep. But there's 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 so there's so much there's so much of the stuff that's out there that is cla- that's classified, and it's almost exclusively because of uh, money issues. They don't they don't want their that's their goose that lays the golden egg, and it does it every fiscal year. Fiscal year, it lays another big gigantic egg, and mm-hmm. and you know we you know we don't even we don't even get the broken shells. I mean, we have we you know we had absolutely nothing out of these uh, these programs, Mm-mm. and and like Ben Ben Rich told me, he said security adds twenty five percent to the cost minimum twenty five percent the cost of any program. Mm. So to keep some programs classified well beyond the date that they should be released to the general public, Mm -hmm. uh, it may be a fun exercise. Well, let's see if we can keep this classified for another six months or six years or 10 years or a decade or two decades or whatever. Um, it, 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 it's gobbling up expensive resources that could be used for other things. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So it's it's crazy. I, I, yeah. I mean, to the point where it's like these things are still classified when people have even forgotten what they were. There, there are things that are classified above top secret that relate to the 1940s designed and 50s vintage strategic bomber, the Convair B-36. What the hell for? I mean, every anybody, <laughs> anybody that was alive when they built it and they flight tested it, and when they operated it, are either in nursing homes or pushing up weeds somewhere, you know, mm-hmm. in, in the local cemetery. Yeah. And you know, I was trying to get some stuff out, out of uh, out of Convair, and they said, I, I I can't respond to that because the government still has it classified. Why? That's Eighty years ago. Because they can. It's ridiculous. That's, Absolutely that, ridiculous. That's the the answer to that. I mean, it's just it, it's it's insanity. It's absolute insanity. So there is a I know, we, we just have, around that I just want to like <laughs> Yeah. Driving me crazy. I had a I had a buddy of mine at state when I was stationed at Lowry. His reflexes were so good to fly come by and he could grab Oh, it. that's what I need right now. Because the yeah. stupid thing, well, I don't even know how it got in here. That's that's a real rarity. <laughs> And Trust it keeps me. going by the like. So if anybody sees something going by, that's what it is. It's a stupid fly. It's what you need. To what, you, what you need to get, you can get the uh, salt guns. You put you, you put table salt in them, and it's you, yeah. you, you crash. You uh, pull back the thing, and then it's a it's Help a pop, salt. and you hit the salt, and of course it's like a shotgun, and it'll right. it'll take them out. You boom. It's like as long as they're within about three or four feet from you, you'll get them. Three or four feet, this stupid little thing, trying to be nice, <laughs> keeps buzzing right by me. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. Right between yeah. me and the camera. It's like it's doing it on purpose at this point. Yeah. 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 Can you imagine? Lulu would be like licking everything because I'd be like trying to get that stupid fly and she'd think it was like the greatest day of her life because now there's salt everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but I mean, but it, but only, it only takes you know one or two shots, and you and you got them. I'm gonna get one of those. Yeah, that sounds like fun. You, you, can probably, you can probably go on Amazon or or uh, well, there's a craft a craft place, Michaels, Michaels Craft. Oh, yeah, yeah, they may have something like that there because it's it's sort of a novelty thing. Yeah, but it is it is kind of cool. If it works. That's yeah, awesome. and it works. I mean, it's non-polluting. Uh, you can you can shoot your brother and it's not going to hurt him. You don't want to shoot him in the eye, but uh, it sounds kind of fun actually. Trying yeah. to shoot just just again, right here. Yeah, yeah. yeah you got your number, buddy. Getting a yeah. salt gun tomorrow. Yeah. Oh my god. Yeah. Oh, I know. I that, I when, hey, when, I, when I'm up in places that I can't have a gun, mm. uh, I have a. Uh, 
I have two, I have two things that I, I carry with me, actually three things. One's an aluminum baseball bat, mm -hmm. but I also have a glove with me. So they can't say that, you know, I bought the bat just to beat up somebody. And I never have, by the way. Yeah. The other thing is I have, I have, uh, <laughs> <laughs> the moment you said, well, I can't have my gun, my husband's yeah. like, yes, yes. yes. <laughs> my kind of guy. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I have a can of wasp spray. Some guy's coming yeah. after you, you hit him and it'll stream 15, 20 feet away. Wow. You, hit him, you hit him in the face, he's going to drop and hit the ground. You're not going to kill him. You're not going to injure him uh, permanently, but he'll wish that he had decided to do something different that day that he tried to, that he tried to run you down or attack you, whatever. And I, I never thought military. of that. And that's legal everywhere. Absolutely. That's brilliant. And you, you want, you want to use uh, the big can, uh, and I keep it right on my, on my passenger seat. It's right there. Yeah. That's uh, super smart. But, but the other thing I have that is can really do some damage, but it's legal everywhere is I have a hunting type of slingshot. And a hmm. bag of a bag of marbles. You pull oh. that back, and it has a thing that goes around here, so you can really pull. Yeah. And uh, you can, you know, you can put you can put a welt on somebody that he's not he or she is not going to forget for a long time. <laughs> I mean, if you hit him in the eye or the face, I mean, you could possibly kill him. But I. Yeah, I could. But, yeah. But you I, also you always, yeah. you always go for the the largest body mass, and and her. Yeah. When I was a, when I was a kid. I was a juvenile delinquent and I used to, I was hanging, I was with a, 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 a sort of like my idol. His name was Theo Rambanis and Theo rode with Hell's Angels. Uh, he ended up being a Rhodes Scholar later on in life. And they tried to throw him out of high school because he had tattoos. This is, oh, back, God forbid. This is, this is back in the fifties. <laughs> and delinquent. Yeah. And one weekend uh, it was Theo, myself and two other people, we had gone to a dance in East Palo Alto. East Palo mm -hmm. Alto has always been a dangerous place, mm -hmm. especially if you have, if you have the wrong uh, ethnicity attached to you versus yeah. the, the locals. And there was a guy named Wimpy Cupid. That's his name. And his brother was Connie Stevens. And they were always in the paper. It was Wimpy Cupid, who's 6'10", and his little brother, who's 7'2". And they had heard that we had a wine in our car and I didn't know Theo carried a military grade 1911 40, you know, 45 caliber handgun. Hmm. And he had, he had the first two rounds were half powder and had the slug removed hmm. and filled with paraffin wax. Hmm. That was the two first two, the, the next two, I think it was seven round clip magazine the second two was was full a full load of powder but still with paraffin and then mm -hmm. the the rest were hollow points oh, wow. and we were surrounded we were, we were leaving the the, the ymc you know, the ymca there in east palo alto the band is you know the the dancing had come to an end and we're sitting in the in the car and all of a sudden we were surrounded by locals mm -hmm. and one of them was wimpy cupid and we, it was during the summer where the windows were rolled down. Wimpy reaches in and grabs Theo. Now, Theo was a Golden Glove boxing champion when he was in, lived in Canada. Wow. Wimpy grabs hold of him. Same time, Theo pulls out the 45 and, and points it right at his chest. And he sort of jumps back and he said, you don't have the balls to use that. He said, <laughs> take one step. And he did. And Theo fired the shot. Uh, Wimpy had a leather jacket on, so you know, even if even if it was a full load, uh, it wouldn't kill him. Okay. But him right in the breastbone, Oof. knocked him back about five or six feet, knocked the window. He's unconscious. Oh my gosh! And everybody just went poof, disappeared. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine. So Theo got out, checked his pulse. Yeah, he's yeah. doing okay. And then we we got in the car and left. Oh jeez. Yeah. I was I was fifteen. That was you know that was sort of my introduction. And says, uh, "Do you shoot people?" I don't, but I know people that do. It's amazing. So, it's funny. It's it's fun. It's interesting. And like, guns are just an interesting topic for me. Like I grew up around them. I grew up on military bases, and 
my dad had guns. He actually had like a collection of um, World War II era guns, which were mm-hmm. really, really interesting. Um, and I remember just like, I, you know, some people have issues with them, but I remember just sitting as a kid and like, sounds really weird now maybe, but like watching my dad clean the guns was so relaxing. Like there's just something to it that it's just, it's very relaxing. I don't know. Well, I'm just a weird person. I've, I've told Ben and Joe, the UFO garage guys mm. who, I, who I love. And by the way, there's teachers from them. Yes. And I thank them. It's very cool. It's, it's amazing. SR 71 Blackbird, the Interceptor, and then the bottom down here. And if I stand up because of the type of background I have, you can't see it. But it says Jim Goodall. Yes. It's and awesome. I'm, uh, I just love those guys. And again, like I said, I, there's most everybody in the community, this community, I really do enjoy. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it's, there's there's just there's 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 something about guns that are fascinating. I know when I was when I was the the curator at the Pacific Aviation Museum in Pearl Harbor, I did that for four years. I got a call from a, a gentleman who lived in Con, uh, who lived in Kailua, which is on the windward side of Oahu, and he said, "Yeah, at the end of the war, when I was in Saipan, they had uh, I was flying my B twenty four B twenty five, I guess, with Mitchell." And he said, we'd landed there for fuel and spent a couple of days there. And uh, they just had a pile of, of Japanese weapons there. He said hmm. swords, handguns, machine hmm. guns. So he picked up a light machine gun. It had the, what is it? The chrysanthemum, I think, is the uh, flower of Japan. Yes. And virtually everything that came that was uh, recovered during the war and that the federal government had an opportunity to get their hands on, they have ground that chrysanthemum off. Hmm. This one had it intact. Ooh. And, and I asked, he was 90 some odd years old. And I, I said, uh, uh, how long have you had it? And I said, since August, 1945. Oh, wow. <laughs> and I said, uh, uh, he said, I'm, I'm getting old. I, I don't, I don't want my grandkids or great grandkids to find it because he also had all the ammunition for it too. Yeah. So I, I tried to get a weapons handling permit, just a one day thing from uh, the Hawaiian, uh, the Honolulu police. Mm-hmm. And the only people who can get those things are people of power and influence, primarily politicians and wealthy people. And they said, you can't, so I just said, okay, if if they bust me when I go on to Fort Island, which is a military reservation with ammunition and a fully operational uh, medium, I mean, it weighs the things weighs about thirty pounds. Wow! So, and Japanese fighter, you know, inf- infantry guys weren't that big, so it it would be a heavy machine gun, but they call it a light machine gun, huh. was the crush prep term. And I, you know, I got it to the museum. I, I, got my boss to go take a look at it and opened up the trunk of my car and he says oh, we got to we this we can't have this here <laughs> and i said okay what do you want to do with it and he said i oh, got a he's a friend who's a uh, federally licensed firearms mm-hmm. dealer uh we're going to have him store it indefinitely until we figure out what to do with it because mm-hmm. what what the federal government wants you to do is render it inoperable and render an apple in some cases it means cutting the barrel now this is a historic yeah. artifact yeah and it's it's 100 percent authentic there has wow. is, there's been no modifications but yeah that was one that was one of the major concerns so i don't i i, I said render it inoperable just take the make sure there's no bullets in it it's no, not no, operable yeah take the fire shoot pin, anything you know, take the firing pin out you know maybe yeah. maybe put a a plug on the inside of it so it looked, I mean, you can look down the barrel and see everything, but you, you know, there's no way you can put a, you can put a weapon in it, but it's, yeah. it's the burn before reading people that want to destroy everything. Yeah. Yeah. They said, uh, so. Yeah, so, absolutely. It's yeah. crazy, but that's, that's very cool. I mean, I think it's interesting, you know, it's a part of our history. It really is. Um, I mean, they are historical items. Like you said, like I, the ones, like I said, my dad had some World War II era guns. They were fascinating. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. interesting to see. Oh, another thing that's, that was interesting that I, you know, that speaking of a war and whatever, when I was in Hawaii, you know, I was single most, most of the time I was there mm-hmm. and I had, uh, I had a dance partner, a uh, beautiful lady from, she's Japanese, 
uh, a little bit younger than me. She was in her you know, late fifties, early sixties. Great dancer. I took her to the Pacific Aviation Museum to show her. Oh, actually, we went, went through the Arizona Memorial, and we went to uh, the USS Missouri, and then went to Pacific Aviation Museum, which was my museum. And she was absolutely beside herself. She had, and she's college educated. She had no idea that Japan attacked the United States of America on December 7th, 1941. How did she not know that? She had absolutely, she was devastated. Said, how can we do that to our, to our, one of the best friends that Japan's ever had? Well, we weren't friends at the time. No, no. And <laughs> I mean, and in today, in today's so-called education system here in the United States, uh -huh. they're, you know, foreign countries are teaching their third and fourth graders complex math mathematics and, yeah. and whatever. And we're, we're teaching our kids political correctness. Right. Yeah. You know, something, something's wrong with that. Something else. We have, and, you know, we have to, you, if someone wants to be identified as such, then you have to, you have to ad adhere to that bowl. Yeah. If, yeah, I want to, I want to identify as a billionaire. It's not going <laughs> to do me any good. Me too. Yeah. <laughs> but I don't know. I, I, I have, I have a feeling that uh, the, the education system in the United States, other than private, some, you know, a lot of private schools, and whatever, and and some very dedicated parents. We're we're raising a generation of people that have no morals. I really can't talk about that, but uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> takes no responsibility for their action. Uh -huh. They have the answer to everything. Oh my god! Nothing's my fault. They don't have any work ethic. That's true. They're there's, entitled. Yeah, there's a there's about a three or four minute YouTube video on a millennial going in for a job interview, and it's a young girl, mm -hmm. and they're talking about. Well, we start next Monday eight o'clock. I I have I I haven't had it my, all my sleep yet, and I I usually don't I I don't even get out of bed until ten or ten thirty, and I and I have my yogurt and I have this and that and whatever it is. <laughs> And I can I can probably be in here uh, just before lunch break. And this, I mean, everything the person said, this she had an answer to. And oh my God, sorry, she, princess. Yeah, and then if I said, uh, well, you know, there's no no reason for you to come in Monday because you're not getting the job. For what? what you're you're firing me out already? I he said, dear, <gasps> I haven't hired you. <laughs> uh, and you know they, That's you know, hilarious. they imme they immediately wanted wanted uh, vacation days and some time off for for oh, some yeah. something. And it's crazy. I mean, you can't get anything you can't get anything done anymore. Yeah. And no, it's, it's true. It's and, and and maybe that's what the aliens did. They injected that into the water, you know, the water supply, and it makes everybody <laughs> saying, eh, yeah, yeah, yeah. To yeah. the government more yeah. than anything. Yeah. yeah. They're definitely uh well, you know, they're creating a very submissive society, you know. Everybody's uh, everybody's offended. Mm -hmm. uh, everybody has a chip on their shoulder. Uh mm -hmm. it's crazy. I don't know. I, I I look and and it's it's because of my age, I know. It's not. No, I look at my kids. I have all teenagers for anyone who doesn't know, and they're just like, you know. 17 and they're like oh my friends like they all quit this whatever grocery store let's say because they don't pay their employees enough i'm like pay their employees enough you're 15 16 how much do you think you're supposed to be getting minimum wage babe that's what you make like my, they don't get it oh, i got a sweetie dog oh miss scarlet Ooh, which will be there which will be there. <laughs> she's my baby. She's oh, so cute. Oh, sweet girl. Yes. Aww. I don't know. How'd you get in here? Does she have her little, is that a thunder jacket or is that like a cooling? Yeah, no, that's a, that's a thunder shirt. Yeah, she's, yeah, she gets really weird in wind and, and, and she's our rescue. She was, she's yeah. a, she's, she's a, so she was a feral, she was a feral street dog. 
I could see she's vicious. Oh yeah, you could you sweet girl. She's so pretty. Oh my yeah. god. Oh she is she is beautiful and so cute. And she is loving. Yeah, yeah. aren't you? Huh? And you've been oh. lick, <laughs> and you've been licking your paw, huh? You want to, I have to open the door, let her out. Hold yeah, on. go for it. It's just so cute. Oh my gosh. Oh, right. uh, yeah, it's Rodrigo. Uh, her name is Scarlet. She's so cute, isn't she? Oh my god, that face. I love how she turned and kind of gave her side view, like you may look upon me. Oh, don't you come over here? I will allow it. <laughs> so cute. Oh my god. <laughs> it it she's terrified of wind. Oh. And okay. she's she's terrified of thunder and lightning. Yeah. And it's uh it's it's a it's a she gets really, really uh spooked out when the weather's bad and and we're in the we're in the beginning of monsoon season where we hey, of, Enzo's here. We, we got we got a lot of uh wind and stuff oh and, poor and she's outside she, the wind doesn't bother her. we get 40 mile an hour winds with gusts to 60 sometimes huh. and it's the buffeting and it's the it's the sound it's, of it it's, it's probably the the change in in the, the atmospheric pressure that she's that really mm. freaks her out so yeah. when she's outside she's fine huh. And uh, she was yeah. picked, she was picked up on Fourth of July of twenty twenty. Aww. And they figured she'd been on she'd been out on her own since she was probably a pup. Wow. Aww. She, so she was a feral street dog, and the, and the, the crew that picked her up uh, from uh, Marac Maricopa County, which is Phoenix uh, mm -hmm. Animal Control. The uh, shelter that they were that they work out of is is been known as a kill shelter. Oh. But she was so beautiful, and even though she even though she was uh, uh, a street dog, you could tell she was very very lovey. Yeah. And uh, and hi Enzo, how's it going? And they they called a place called Heidi's Village. Yeah. Actually, they called the Better Days Rescue that has a. That rent space at Heidi's Village, and yeah. they took her in, and they they worked on her for four months wow. before they put her up for adoption to teach her some commands mm -hmm. and house trained. Wow! And she's just she doesn't respond to her name because that's that sort of uh, burnt into their skull when they're puppies. Mm -hmm. She doesn't know how to chase. She doesn't know how to fetch. That's okay. But she, but she is the most wonderful, loving, sweet dog that there is. Yeah. And, and my wife, when I told her I wanted to get a German Shepherd, she said, they shed. And she's OCD. <laughs> she says, I'm not OCD. Yes, you are. I mean, I can set something down. You'll come by it and you'll move it just a little bit, you know. Yeah. Make sure it's exactly parallel to whatever whatever That's she's looking hilarious. at. And says, you can't love a dog. You can like a dog. You can, you know, be a companion dog, but to she never had a dog. I'm sure. I was gonna say she's probably she had, never had a dog. She had, yet. she had farm dogs that lived, you know, that lived in the mm -hmm. barn and never, were yeah. never in the house. And to see her, we went to Minnesota for uh, for five days uh, to see my, you know, to see my son, my daughter, and, and my mm -hmm. grandkids. And uh, like I said earlier, I was, and we stayed with my ex wife. That's yeah. that's that's what gets that's what weirds people out. No. Stay with your ex. <laughs> I said I bought the house. What can I say? I mean, <laughs> she owns it, but I bought it. Uh, and she was Rosemary was just absolutely beside herself, missing her dog. Mm -hmm. I said, "Do you miss me when I go on the road? If She's I'm like, gone for two weeks?" Much. Well, well, not the same. I yeah. <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay, thanks a lot. But she, she's our she's our fur baby, and yeah. I just. And I, when we when we went to Minnesota, I couldn't put her in a kennel. Mm. Uh, and we had a friend come over who uh, actually goes uh, walking with her in the morning with yeah. my wife. I, I had knee replacement and I and mm. I tripped and fell over over Scarlet oh. when I came off a road trip. I landed oh, full gosh. weight on my brand new knee, and it's, oh no, it's it's, it's been hurting. It's it. it Oh. Almost, I almost passed out from pain. Oh my God! Did you get it checked out? Please oh say yeah, you did. I, I, the next day I, I went back to my orthopedic guy, and he, yeah. they did a, 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 they took a close look at it with an MRI and said mm -hmm. 
uh, an x-ray said nothing's broken, nothing's out of place, but there's probably a lot of soft tissue damage. Yeah. And it may, it may take a year or so for it yeah. to, so. Oh, yikes. But so, uh, and, and my, our friend's name was Michael as well. And you know, mm. Michael, Michael came over here and his you know, girlfriend came over with him and, oh, nice. and uh, Scarlett just absolutely loves Michael. Oh. And, uh, she was, uh, she, she was a happy girl. Unfortunately, oh, fortunately, there, there wasn't any bad weather yeah you know, when we were gone so yeah well that's good but our, our next trip if if we're thinking about maybe going to uh minnesota mm. not this year but next year for maybe a month mm -hmm. and stay at my at my friend's place on lake, on lake sylvia yeah and she has three dogs oh nice so, so would you bring her with you oh absolutely absolutely yeah, because uh, she travels well all good and 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 a lot of hotels, or not a lot of motels, I should say, uh, are pet friendly. Yeah. And she's, uh, you know, she only she only uh, does her business once in the morning, and that's usually it. But when we walk her, you know, walking her every fifteen feet, she has to squat down and just leave a mark. <laughs> <laughs> but I've been here. Yep, I mean, my Westies like that too. Yeah, yeah, but she's, but the the lady, the ladies from from Better Days, and they're the ones who, who work mm. with her. They said that uh, they normally do not allow uh, adoptions outside of the Greater Phoenix area. Yeah, and, and we're almost a hundred miles away. Oh wow! But because I I had I had German Shepherds in the past. Yeah, and they had to come and take a look at the at the house to make sure that the yard was secure and she couldn't get out. Mm -hmm. And then she said, "Well, if you want to follow me up to Phoenix, I'll let you meet Scarlett." So we oh. went up there, and uh, we brought her home. Oh, and she's been she's been with us ever since. She's oh. so beautiful. She's, yeah, and she is gorgeous. She is mm -hmm. gorgeous. That so, face. So we're we're blessed with that. We're yeah. blessed with that. Oh. So what's what's new and exciting on the UFO front? We've been talking about everything, but it. You know, I know. But you know what? That's okay. Sometimes it's good just to sit back and chat, right? Yeah, right. Everybody's enjoying right. it. I've been reading in the in the chats. Rodrigo's telling us about the, uh, uh, the uprising, the rebellion in Puerto Rico. No, was it Puerto? No, not Puerto Rico. Uh, Portugal, Portugal in the seventies. It's been fascinating. Uh -huh. uh, <laughs> so we've been having several conversations going at once, but not one gun fired. I didn't know this. Did you know oh, no. there was no. a rebellion in the seventies no. in Portugal? No, not one gun fired. No. What's interesting? uh let's see where, where did he say it uh hold on um so he's he's having this conversation with my husband but david the whole country turned including the generals on the ruling class they didn't have a chance there were songs on the radio coded so the whole country could be on the same page that's really cool so they we use need, songs we're gonna, we're gonna need that here i know right they use songs yeah. to yeah. to communicate about it that's amazing says so, yeah, yeah the musicians are considered national heroes to this day and they made great music too. That's really, really cool. Super, super. Yeah, I love it. Yeah, we are definitely going to need that here. It's crazy. Yeah, yeah. It, it is. It is going nuts. And oh, uh, I mean, same rescue, better day rescue. Yes. And so found yep. the website. Everybody, go check them out if you're in the area. Yeah, they, they are. Yeah. Every, you know, at least, well, the first year we had her, about once a week, I would send both Vicky and Hannah, the two ladies that. Yeah. Uh, were responsible for her training and her rescue. And I, I sent her up, I sent them updates and they mm -hmm. can tell that she's a happy girl. Good. And, uh, and I just love her to pieces. And it's, uh, if you have, if you have money that hasn't been used on, uh, expensive food or, you know, out of control gas prices, right. uh, send them something. We, we, I send them something about once a quarter oh, just, nice. just because, yeah, I we are so pleased and so delighted to have Scarlett as our fur baby, Aww. and well, I just and it and, it and it just cracks me up uh, with Rosemary's obsession with her doggy. She just <laughs> I it just it 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 does my heart good. Oh, yeah. that's so good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's one of the things my my last ex wife told me. She says, you know, is is. As big and gruff as you can be, I says I've never seen anybody so gentle and loving with with dogs. I'd sit on the floor and I had yeah. uh, Bear and Charlie Brown. Brown. Bear was my female. She was seventy oh, pounds. She was pure purebred German bred German Shepherd. Mm. And then Charlie Brown was from the same mother, but a different uh, uh, sperm donor. 
mm-hmm. uh, but uh, purebred German. And he's, she, he was 130 pounds and I'd sit, sit on the floor and they'd come in right next to me. And I just, I mean, sometimes we'd watch TV and I'd have my arms around both of them. And they were just, mm-hmm. uh, and I just love dogs. I just really do. And, yeah. uh, and they're amazing. Yeah. And thank you, Chris. I just, uh, <laughs> dog, dogs just bring a lot of joy in life. When every, mm-hmm. every, when everything in your, your life is, is turning to snot, uh, well, like the old saying goes, what is, what is the definition of true love? True love is putting your dog and your girlfriend or wife in the trunk of your car on a hot day, driving around all day long, bumpy roads and everything else. And when you open the trunk, who's happy to see you? <laughs> <laughs> that is, that's, the defi- that's the definition of true love. That's the definition of true love. And, and she's she's just she's just our sweet dog, and I just uh, really? I can't I can't say en- enough wonderful things about her, and we're blessed. Uh, yeah, I figured and, Dave would enjoy that one. <laughs> yeah, and, uh, but no, oh well, yeah, well, and, that's hilarious. But, but the other the other thing that she doesn't bark. Oh, that's amazing! Wow. And we had her three weeks, and I thought maybe they had taken out her vocal cords, which I think is criminal. Do people do that? That's horrible. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think it's primarily with yappy little, little. Th- oh, you have a little yappy. I have, yeah. yeah, I have yeah. yappy little one. Yes, I know. Yeah. Even I uh, would think that's mean to do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and so at five thirty exactly every evening, if I'm still on this stupid computer, as my wife refers to it, yeah, <laughs> Scarlett will come in and she'll paw the back of my chair, and if I if I ignore her. She'll sit, she'll come to the side and she'll start barking at me. And the first time mm-hmm. she barked at me, I had I never I never knew she could bark. It scared oh. the hell out of me because she has a loud bark. I bet. She's a big dog. And, yeah. And <laughs> but oh, oh, she's just a wonderful girl. Yeah. <laughs> that is also true. Yes. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> oh, what's that smell? All right. Oh, yeah. It's Lulu. Yeah. Yes. We well, love Lulu I... too. She's a little different than than Scarlett. She she yeah. you know. I told Dave Hurley I was like she'll grow on you. She because she's super. She's very. She's got two modes like highly annoying or very very cute. And I'm like she'll grow on you. She's like a fungus. She grows on you. You grow to love her and miss her when she's not there. He loves her. Doesn't miss her when she's not there. <laughs> yeah. Well, if I if I give anybody a hug, my wife or friends come over. I'm, I was raised by a Sicilian mom, so everybody gets yeah. a hug. Yeah. I, she'll be, Char, Scarlett would try to get in between because she wants to be part of that she hug. She wants a hug. Aww. Yeah. Yeah. So, so cute. So, oh, yeah. Are she's wonderful. Really she's yappy. wonderful. Now, I, yappy. She just yells. Yeah. I, I haven't I haven't breached the subject yet, but I'm going to ask a, a hmm. friend of mine of over 30 some odd years who's, uh, if he, if and I'm not going to say his name, but if he were to say yes, yeah, it would, it would probably set the internet on fire, and, um, and I'll tell you offline. I won't tell. I won't say okay. it online because I don't want anybody to get you know too excited. And I don't know if he will. Yeah. Um, he was contacted by a radio host, offered mm-hmm. him ten grand for thirty minutes. Wow. And, and he's turned him down. Flatly turned him down. Yeah. Wow. Uh, so, Goodness. but I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to ask. Yeah, why not? And all, all you can do is say no. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. that's okay. Yeah. And yeah, 10 grand. Oh my God. I'd be like, yes. And what do you want me to talk about it? Yeah. When would you like it? Clothes or, <laughs> with or without clothes. You know? yeah, exactly. For 10 yeah. grand. This, this is, this is the horror show, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, we really have way too much fun on these Monday, you know, these Monday evening uh, get-togethers. Yes, I just I thoroughly enjoy it. Oh, now, uh, next Monday is going to be the Fourth of July weekend. Yes. So, and, I'm no show next Monday. Yeah. So, okay. Yes. Okay. Everybody, go watch your fireworks. Celebrate if you're in yeah. the U.S. If not, yeah. sorry. My, my poor baby just has a heart. You know, Scarlett has just a terrible time with uh, fireworks and such. Yeah. My Ralphie, yeah. my Westie does too. Luckily, he's going deaf, so that helps. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. He so. used to go oh, bananas. He would get, we call it Benny butter, which is Benadryl mixed with peanut butter to calm him ah, down. Ah, yes. that's a good yeah. idea. Yes. Yeah. It helps. 
Well, he he gets his she gets her treatsies in the morning. She has Aww. she has allergies and she licks her paws a lot. So um, I read Ralphie after, used to do that too. Have you figured out what she's allergic to yet? Uh, no, because I mean she gets science diet. She doesn't mm. get people food. Uh, Try going grain free and non typical proteins. I had to do this with Ralphie because Westies have a lot of like skin allergies, and he was licking just the hair off of his paws. He was licking yep. them so much, and it was yep. all red. Um, so I ended up going with like non typical proteins because I was did a ton of research and tried a bunch of different things. So things like bison, duck, uh, venison and then grain free. And that, that did the trick and didn't have any more issues with him anymore. Oh, okay. So I'll try that. that. See. Yeah. Is I it, can, I'll, it, um, I'll send you some, a couple of brands that I would definitely recommend. Okay. okay. All right. And, yeah. and what I'll, what I'll do is, so it's not an air, but I'll, I'll just send you a brief note on okay. who I'm, you probably, you probably know, know. Yeah. you probably know who it is. <laughs> I have an idea. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. 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 So I've yeah. never, I've never asked him for any favors. Yeah. In 30, you know, 32 years, I've known. Yeah. Well, it doesn't hurt to ask. Like you said, no. the worst you can do is say no. And yeah. that's okay. Yeah. And uh, I don't know if, he, if he'd be on for two hours, would be on for 10 minutes. I don't know. But I think I think it would be fun. Oh, yeah. To, to I would hear, love it. Hear it from the horse's mouth. Oh, my God. So to speak. I would love talking to him, even if he's not on the show. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I and I, I got a, I got a buddy of mine who just uh, he retired four years ago from the Skunk Works, and mm-hmm. he yeah he knows what my what my passions are, and he's now the new you know, director of of engineering for Virgin Galactic. Yeah. Wow. And he would, and he was, before he retired from the Skunk Works, he was du- director of strategic and unmanned systems. Oh, wow. He was like the number three guy there. And, wow. Uh, just a very dear friend. I've known him for 40 years. And it, I guess when you get my age, knowing people for 40 or 50 years is not unusual. But <laughs> <laughs> but that's amazing to say that you've known these people for that long. I think that's incredible. Yeah. Yeah. And I have, I have friends that go, you know, my, my oldest, who was my oldest friend from high school mm-hmm. after 61 years turned his back on me, mm-hmm. I think because of his wife. And he was supposed to come and fly down and give us a visit before he moved back to New Zealand. He's from here. Yeah. And he has he had dual citizenship. And he told me that uh, uh, I wasn't, our friendship wasn't worth the airfare. Oh my God. That's a horrible thing to say. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So, uh, and we'll say to Justin A.D. You know, Maynard, hello. Hey, Justin. You're just coming in at the very end, or you've been watching the whole time. Well, Justin's I, I, in Australia, so it's got to be yeah, I, a good morning for him. I love Australia. If if I was young and foolish like I was when I was young and foolish, and I had the opportunity to go to Australia, I would in a heartbeat. I would love to go. It's one of the places I haven't been. Uh, I, I, I spent three weeks. I spent three weeks in uh, the east, you know, in primarily in Queensland. Mm-hmm. Queensland, yeah, and then I stayed in Sydney, actually in Little Bay. Uh, I have friends up in Brisbane. I have, uh, I, I went to, uh, the capital, Victor- you know, Victoria and Cambry. So it was supposed to be Canberra, mm-hmm. but a, a distinguished, a, a lady of status was, uh, when they, she was reading the dedication, when they were going to build this, this brand new in the middle of nowhere, capital of Australia, she mispronounced the name Cam- Canberra, they call it mm-hmm. Cambry. And so not to embarrass her now or ever, I mean, she's been long gone now. They still refer to it as Cambry, not Canberra. So, oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah. That was kind of that. It was like, like the original SR-71 was supposed to be the RS-71. Really? But President Johnson was dyslexic and he reversed it. So they had to go in and change all their documentation to read SR versus RS. RS. And what is that? What SR, the SR? Reconnaissance no, spell? I'm guessing. Recon- no, reconnaissance strike. Strike. Okay. Yeah. And the other one is with strategic cool. reconnaissance. So strategic reconnaissance. Yeah. So 
Nice. Yeah, but it's weird. It's weird how some things, how things, some things get named, how some things are pronounced, and whatever. I like so. those little stories, though. Those historical tidbits. I think they're great because it makes yeah. like it personalizes things and it makes it interesting. Yeah. And wow, they probably didn't know that either. <laughs> yeah, okay. Okay. I even have some documentation stand, stating that. So it's awesome. Yeah. Enzo knew, of course he did. Yeah. <laughs> Enzo yeah. knows all. Yeah, well, not all. I know all. You, you only, <laughs> Enzo, you only know some. <laughs> and so, Jim knows 100%. Enzo's at like 98. 99. He's working his way out. 99.6. <laughs> maybe maybe 0.7. Yeah. So. There you go. You're high. Here is, as show. usual, it was uh, a wonderful, fast two hours. Yes, it was. And, it was so much fun. I'm, Michael, and, oh, so glad he came on and showed us his pictures. They're amazing. And I'll, I'll have him come on again. Yeah. Uh, anytime. When he's, you know, when he's not, tra when he's not on the road, I mean, he, he goes down there and he pays an arm and a leg to, you know, uh, yeah. to uh, sit down and work with the artist. Mm. And that's got to be frustrating uh, and expensive. And yeah. Michael, Michael spends all his free time and all his free money on just digging up and, re and researching uh, UFOs. It's amazing. Does he have like yeah. a, a Patreon or a, like... Anywhere we got to find that out so we can put it up there for people. I'll find. I'll look it up and see. I, I don't know if I don't know if he does, but he but should. he should. Yeah, Michael, and I adore the guy. He's like he's like a kid of mine, and, yeah. and he sort of looks at me as his dad figure. Yeah. Um, I said, well, I can't have a fifty-two-year-old son. Well, yes, I can because. <laughs> Uh, my son's 46 and yeah, you know, and my wife didn't have him until I was, you know, I was 30 years old when he was born. So yeah, I could have some really old kids. No, <laughs> no he's for whatever reason, you know, Michael doesn't, doesn't realize how special he really is no. and, and what an absolute expert he is. Mm -hmm. And the thing, the thing I love about Michael, there, there's no, when he when he's given a presentation on, on an event like he did uh, today, he doesn't interject his own personal thoughts or feelings. He is reporting the facts as they're known, along with the supporting documentation, interviews, mm -hmm. drawings, and he's tracked down a number of the these first person uh, uh, people who, who saw whatever it was. And he's actually talked to him either in person or on the phone. And he, he goes somewhere almost every weekend to interview people or to dig up stuff. Now he took last, last week, he flew a week that just ended. Mm -hmm. uh, he flew to Roswell on Wednesday and for Thursday and Friday. And he scanned 10,000 documents. Wow. Some of the stuff blew, blew, said there's stuff in here that'll just blow you away. And he sent a few, a few, a few items to me and he said all the, all the print documentation, everything is, is, was done in, uh, in PDF. So, it, you know, so you can search words and come up with all the documents that have certain, you know, the UFO or flying saucer or, uh, you know, someone's name you want to, you know, you think you, right. you think you know someone who may have been this or that or whatever you punch a name in. And of those 10,000 documents, if that name is listed in there, it will bring up that, you know, that document. Wow. So, and he, uh, uh, Dr. Greer convinced him to get a uh, new type of scanner. Mm -hmm. uh, he said, flat, flatbed scanners, at one at a time, one at a time. He said, but really document scanners, you put in 50 pages and it automatically feeds. And it's, wow. it's just, it's really, really quick. Oh, wow. But, yeah. And it, for, it formats in PDF. Mm. So uh, it makes oh. it makes everything very searchable. Yeah. So he had 10,000 10, documents or 10,000 uh, events. There may be more pages. And one of the PDF uh, files he sent me, he only sent me four. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's about 30 or 40 pages long. And I, I haven't had a chance to read it yet. because I didn't get home until yesterday from Minnesota. Mm -hmm. I had to get up at the equivalent of 3 a.m. Arizona time to... Get cleaned up, get to the air, you know, get to the airport. Mm -hmm. And I was, it only took three minutes to get through security, which I don't know how in the hell that happened. <laughs> but, <Yeah. laughs> uh, 
and I uh, so I, I didn't I didn't get a chance to read it last night because I was a little bit too fried. But I'm gonna I'm gonna yeah. uh, I'll read it tonight. So, awesome. but Lynn, it's always it's always a delight. Oh, thank you. Uh, it is always a pleasure, Jim. Yeah, and I love the greater Boston area. I love the food. Yeah. Um, I used to stay at the Marriott Long Wharf there mm -hmm. in the North End, and I've I've been to probably 20 restaurants there in the north end they're all delicious uh, cafe de napoli mm -hmm. is one of them. it's on uh, hanover street mm -hmm. also there there's a place called mancha calamari mm -hmm. and i grew up eating squid as a kid because you know my yeah. grandfather was a sicilian fisherman and that's mm -hmm. you know that's just you know that's just good food yeah so i went in there and he's and i'm looking at the i'm looking at the uh menu which i'm up in the chalkboard and everything is uh, 10 feet long maybe 30 feet deep and yeah. the cooking and everything is all done over here and then there's like six or eight tables the uh, the owner of the restaurant uh graduated from radcliffe with a ma master's degree in business but she always wanted to own a, yeah. open a restaurant so i you know i i had, I had three different uh i did a sampling of some of the some of the squid that she had or a calamari i said well I said, this is how my, my, uh, my, my aunt Nora mm -hmm. did it. And I, and I told her what the recipe was. So about three months later, I'm back in Boston. I, I said, I, I crave some squid. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I went, the restaurant was still there and I went in there and I look up there and there is aunt Nora's recipe. Oh, and that's how she put it, aunt Nora's recipe. That's amazing. Oh yeah. 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 So, uh, did you try it? You had to have. Yeah, I mean, it, it was. I it was mean, good? She, it was good. It was delicious. Oh, it was delicious. So that's amazing. Yeah, yeah. I'll have to check it out. I well, as it. as usual, our our one hour went to two hours and six minutes. Uh, always, yeah. Yeah, as always. <laughs> and it's always fun, and you know, the time always flies by. So, yeah. and that's what yeah. makes it that it that's what makes it enjoyable. And I look normally, I don't look didn't never look forward to Mondays. Being I'm retired, every day is a Saturday pretty much. <laughs> uh, but as you know, I, I look forward to Mondays, Monday Aww, after, you know, evenings now I because too. I have a, a chance to you know sit and you know talk with people I enjoy talking with. So yes, I enjoy it as well. And thank you so much. I'm so glad every time I think about it, I'm like, I'm always so glad that you decided to do this with me. It's it's so much fun. And I just I love it. And 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 we can thank Dave Scott. Yes. Yes. Thank you, Dave uh, Scott for introducing us. Yeah, and uh, yeah, I was I was really looking forward to hopefully seeing you in uh, Las Vegas. I know, but of course that didn't happen. But it, no. maybe one of the UFO conferences that uh, we can finally meet face to face. I yeah, think, uh, or I think no I should... some time and go back and forth. So yeah, yeah, I, I have to go to uh, the Air Force Museum. Yes, uh, see some friends of mine that are there. I have a friend of mine who's the. Uh, He's a facility. He's a director of facilities there at the Air Force Museum. Oh, cool! And uh, he's a a combat uh, uh, marine, nice. marine uh, uh, infantry, uh, not infantry, but a, a marine rifleman. Yeah. So, um, and and I and I get to go back in the areas that the general public has no access to, and those are always fun. I want to go. Okay, next yeah. time you go, let me know. I'll go. Yeah. <laughs> I'll make sure. We're actually going back to Ohio on Thursday. I'm going to go oh. with them for about a week, so it'll be oh, fun. Oh, good, good. Well, you have to go to the Air Force Museum. I mean, it's... I love it. Dave hasn't been there yet, so yeah, I'm going to see if maybe we can. I know he wants to go, so hopefully, maybe this time we'll be able to to work it in. It would be it would be a lot of fun. I love it there. I think it's amazing. Yeah, and you'll you'll see all of my favorite airplanes right there. Yeah. That's I know, it. I know. I make my I told you the story, right? I make my kids take a picture in front of the SR seventy one every time. I'll send you the least, the most recent one. Okay. Uh, they're like this. Oh. Because they're just like again, <laughs> again. I'm like, do you not realize what plane you're standing in front of? You ingrateful children. The most incredible ingrateful. airplane ever to fly that we know. Exactly, of. exactly. You get yeah. it. I don't know why they don't. I don't know. I don't ingrateful know. kids, they take it for granted. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe it has an impact on me because I was an 18-year-old kid when I saw my first one on March 10th, 1964. 
I don't remember how old I was, but I fell in love with it the moment I saw it. It was amazing. How can you not? I mean, if you, if you're in if you're into things that fly, if you're into things that are just cool looking, right? I mean, one of the one of the reasons is called Habu. Habu is the name of a an ill tempered black snake found on Okinawa. That's a member of the cobra family. Oh wow! And they're just uh, they're they're black. They're sinister. I uh, I don't know if they have red eyes or not, but mm -hmm. uh, uh, the, the locals started calling the blackbird Habu. Yeah, because it's because, a badass looking plane. Oh, it is. It is. Yeah. And uh, I've been over every square inch of that airplane, and I'm just absolutely amazed. And I have pieces and parts of it. Um, and I'm just so delighted that I was able to scrounge one from the Air Force yeah. for uh, 15 years before they stole it back from right? me. How dare they? So. If I'd have been, if I still lived in Minnesota, they would have had a harder chance, a harder time trying to get it. Yeah. Uh, as it was, Maybe. as it was, it was over the holidays and it sort of fell between the cracks, which was part of their plan. Oh, those sneaky, sneaky devils. Yeah, bastards. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, dear, you have a uh, a wonderful evening. What's left of it? And thank uh, you. You too. Say hello to your your good looking husband for me. I uh, will. I, I, I will. Uh, I hope to meet both you know, both of you in person one of these days yes. in the new, too not distant future. Yes, uh, absolutely. I know I'm going to be. I, I I need to go to the East Coast sometime, probably not this year, but early next year. I'm going to start in D.C. and work my way up. Nice. And I, and I have uh, I have some friends that live in New Hampshire, so I will be coming through the greater. Boston oh, there you go. Area. Well, we're actually close to New Hampshire. I'm in the northern part of Massachusetts. So. Okay. Okay. Yeah. They uh, make it happen. They live on the, uh, was it Lake Penasquasi or whatever it is? It's the lake that was oh, used Winnipeg in the movie. Coffee? Yeah, it was used in the movie. Uh, uh, on Golden, what is it? On on Golden, I used to on live Go up there on Golden, on Golden Pond. Pond. On Golden Pond. Yeah. Yeah. I lived up there With for Henry a little Ford, while. My kids yeah. were really, really little. Yeah. Uh, yeah uh, most. Most of my friends are women, mm -hmm. and her husband just—it just grates his teeth, you know, and <laughs> up and good all again. I mean, but we're just friends. That's right. I have tons of guy friends. I can believe it. And most of my friends are women, and most yeah. and a lot of them I've known for 40, 50 years. Yeah. The first woman I ever asked to marry me, I'm still mm -hmm. friends with. I know. That's amazing. And I, I did that. I asked her in 1966. That's awesome. And she said, no. No. Oh, oh, so this is a different one. I was thinking your first wife. Okay. Wow. Oh, no, no, no. How no, many no. women have we asked to marry you, Jim Goodall? <laughs> Five. <laughs> Nicely done. Three of them said yes. Nice. Nicely done. Yeah. Not, not bad odds there. <laughs> one of them, she, I asked her five times. She was four foot ten, 100% Greek. Wow. And... I asked her five times to marry me, and each time she had a reason not to or an excuse. So finally, I said, "Fine." And I, I, and I had a chance to move to Seattle, and mm -hmm. I did. I was living in Minnesota, moved to Seattle, the Seattle area, and uh, I met potentially my uh, next wife there. Mm -hmm. And when uh, Tony heard that I was getting getting married again, but not to her. Mm, she had a nervous, a she had a nervous, nervous breakdown. She was out of work for 12 weeks. Oh my God. I was, I was such a catch that she, yeah, you know, that she missed and lost that it, she just couldn't deal with it. She had five opportunities. She Come did. On. She did. <laughs> Said no one, no one, no one's ever ex accepted me for who I am, except for you. I said, well, why did you tell me to go to hell so many times over the, you know, the course of our relationship? Well, I don't know. So mm -hmm. it happens. Oh, I, yeah, I've, 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 I have a dear friend named Rick. He's been my friend for 60 years and he's been with me for every heartbreak I've given or received. Aww. And my, my, my first one, she was a student nurse. I was part of her thesis. How do you, how do you destroy the young impressionable mind of a boy? And she did <laughs> oh a hell of a job. <laughs> oh I was, God. I was 17. I had never been kissed. And, uh, she did a number on me. And I would have I would have committed a felony for her. Aww. And <clears throat> what the hell? 
Yeah, I get it. Um, so that's where we're at, and yeah. I got I just gotta. I have to call him back here in a minute. I just gotta. Call yeah, no worries. From the no cousin worries. brothers. Oh, Hawaii. yeah. I do. Nice. Yeah, we'll tell yeah. them we said hello. They they spent four <laughs> no five days here last summer. Oh, nice. You talk about burning some brain cells out. Oh my god. <laughs> We had a great time, we, I, and I always have a, I always have a fun time with with the, with the cousin brothers, and they're just you know, two very unique guys that are uh, just a lot of fun to be around and be with. So that's awesome, dear. I'm gonna go. All right, have a you wonderful have, night. You have a wonderful night too, and I will, and you have a, a great Fourth of July. Thank you. Yes, don't, you too. Don't lose any fingers. No, I won't. <laughs> it definitely and, won't and, happen. And the same goes to your handsome husband. Yes. Um, and uh, we'll talk again soon. All right. And so. I'll see you the following Monday after after Fourth of July week. Yes, that's right, everyone. So not yep. next week, but the week after. So two weeks. All right. Yes. Adios. Take care. Good and night. Aloha. And I will talk to you later. All right. All right sounds bye. good. Bye bye. Good night. All right. Thank you, everyone. And I'm going to get yes, ripple effect by request tonight to take us out. All right. Good night, everyone. And thank you so much for being here with us. You guys have been awesome.
Yeah.